We're calling the meeting to order at 6.17, what is 6.16. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa, for always taking our minutes. Thank you, Orkin and Spencer, for being here and making our, our meeting possible online, too. So any, uh, I'll do the welcome in a minute. Any adjustments to the agenda from board members? No. Okay. So I just wanted to, I, I wanted to start today. Oh, yes. Uh, hold on a minute. I have a, a, a question, and I'm, I'm new, so I hope this is an appropriate time to ask it. I'm wondering if we could add to the agenda discussion of Alan Gilbert's request at the last meeting for us to agree not to change the articles of agreement. I don't think we can vote on this tonight, obviously, but I wondered if we could have a discussion about that. So we would need... Yeah, so we can we can we can put it to vote. Uh, our usual process is to bring it to the steering committee, but we can put it to vote to add it to the agenda. So our is so we have asked, answered that question in our questionnaire. But let's go ahead and it, uh, all of those in favor and adding that item to the agenda. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, we'll add that item to agenda. So everybody. Uh, uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? I move. Second. Okay. So Ursula and then Chris. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, we'll add that to the end of the agenda before public comment. All right. Um, right on the. So. Request. Okay. So. The the small welcome today was going to be that the school board has great influence on its district culture. Today we are going to do a little learning as a as a board. We always use the first Wednesday to to learn together. So as a school board, we have great influence on its district culture and climate. The actions we take or fail to take can make or break an effective organizational culture. Uh, so our commitment between each other for trust and respect uh, lays the ground for the success or the failure of the actions that we will take in behalf of our students and our communities. So at the last uh, uh, at the last uh, finance committee uh, meeting, we went over a lot of uh, a lot of data with our uh, with our small committee. And moving to my next, so I wanted to. To start, you know, with we're going to talk about roles and responsibilities, and talk about what the school board does. So sometimes I'm I'm asked uh, by by people that you know I feel like a lot of people feel like the role of the chair is just to be sort of like the taskmaster or the one that gets to make all the decisions. So I wanted to clarify <laughs> a little bit of that in my welcome comments. And I feel when I when I reflect every time after a board meeting, and believe me that I do in what could have done better, or how could I have responded better, or how do we allow more time, or how can we hold space in a much better way that feels more inclusive to all or to our community members. I, I always come back to the same question, you know, what culture do I want to participate in? How can, I, how can we work, and how, and how can the work that we are doing in this moment support the transformation of and I always go a little broader of the world that we're in, and by that also in our in our district. So I, I believe that that we have the ability to work through complexity, which is what we are going to be doing again this year, and we can do that work together. I think we have the ability to handle complexity, and and that is directly tied to our ability to imagine together. And so I I want us to focus on a little bit through this calendar year of us in, in imagining and staying committed and interested in the impact that we can have for generations to come in our district. Some of the actions that we might be taking, we might not see all of the benefits right away, but it will be benefits that will benefit our community for, for years to come. So 
board leadership matters and we all make decisions together whether that is divided decisions when we make a decision we make a decision together and we all stand behind those decisions so with that i'm gonna open it to public comment and so could you raise your go ahead and we have mics I think she went tired. Okay, I think we have somebody muted. Mute. There. Mute. There. Hi, my name is Matt Shambaugh from Berlin. I uh, sent you all an email after your last meeting. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but I want to follow up on that just a tiny bit uh, as far as the whole configuration uh, concept goes. Um, <clears throat> What I came away from the last meeting thinking was the most important criteria that you're discussing are that whatever proposal you come up with is fair, equitable, and sustainable, both for the students and for the community as a whole. And uh, from what I can see that uh, none of the proposals on the table right now meet those criteria in my mind. Uh, as far as sustainability goes, you can't have long-term sustainability if you don't have a long-term plan that uh, uh, does something about the fact that our elementary schools are running at about half of capacity and that that's not sustainable. As far as equi equitability goes, uh, if some students are in small classes with limited uh, opportunities for extracurricular and non-core uh, subjects and other students are in big classes where they have lots of other opportunities that's not equitable for the students uh, as far as fairness goes i think this issue is an issue that is facing the whole district and i don't think it's fair to saddle the the burden on callus and worcester i think we all need to to deal with this issue and Again, none of the it, none of the proposals on the table that I can see meet those three criteria. In my mind, the only uh, solution that is truly fair, equitable, and sustainable is to work in the long term towards bringing all of our students onto the U32 campus uh, and gradually closing down our elementary schools, bringing the students all here onto the campus, build whatever facilities we need that are expandable flexible for changing grade level, number of students in grade levels. And so, uh, if they're all in one campus here, then you can mix and match as needed rather than trying to figure out how to deal with students in Berlin and Callis, which are an hour away from each other or whatever. <laughs> um, so I, I am wondering how you would consider that and Thanks. Are there any opportunities for changing beyond the three proposals you have put forward? I haven't heard much to that effect so far. Thank you. Thank you. And we have two hands. Yeah, oh, more than. So I forgot the timer, but I'll get back to the timer and I'll ask Spencer to help me too. So go ahead, Deborah. Hello. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to comment. I want to draw your attention to the graphs on my screen. Unfortunately, due to some technology difficulties, you can't see the whole thing. The top graph represents <clears throat> students who uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, and the bottom graph represents the median household income. The two points that I want to make that I'm focusing on during this comment are the DOTI percentage of eligible students for free and reduced lunch. And here in the medium household income, the highest number there represents middle sex. By busing students, DOTI students to middle sex, the board is proposing the population with the highest FRL eligibility population be bused to the town with the highest household income. The decision to close DOTI while maintaining middle sex school reeks of classism. In a 2019 article in the Review of Educational Research, which I'm happy to forward to you, the author refers to what you are proposing as spatial injustice. 
and compares it to educational redlining. The board has, says, has said this reconfiguration will provide more opportunities for all our students, referring to the core relief of equity to justify it. Are we all familiar with the difference between equity and equality? If not, here's a refresher. Equity recognizes that people have different circumstances and provides resources and opportunities to achieve equal outcomes. While, equity, while equality treats everyone the same, regardless of differences and needs. Busing Doty students to Middlesex is not equity, it is equality. Middlesex is not prepared to address equity. Based solely on the information that we learned last night regarding capacity, the numbers that we heard last night suggest there will be no full-time pre-K and a first grade class with numbers over EQS. This reconfiguration will only perpetuate inequalities rather than address them. Busing students to a higher income area without addressing their specific needs does not align with our core value and principle of equity. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, David. Hi all, uh, David Lawrence, Middlesex. Mine is actually not on the uh, very uh, uh, contentious topic of reconfiguration. I just wanted to say really quickly that, uh, so we're using this new app from Tyler Technologies for the buses. And it says when you join it, it has a very specific note that says, our district has elected not to um, show where the buses are. Well, it would be tremendously useful to know where the buses are. And I, as a technologist who works very much in the area of internet privacy, I'm having a hard time figuring out like why a choice might have been made to intentionally disable it. Um, but if the if it is a very deliberate choice, I, I'd hope that uh, we'd get some kind of notification that everybody knows why we're not using the feature. Uh, otherwise, I'd encourage the district to please enable it so that we can know where our buses are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I think thank you, David, for that comment. We'll have somebody look in that and get back to you and the rest of the district. Thank you. Um, Lisa. Hi, Lisa Hanna Worcester. Um, when Act 46 consolidation talks were originally happening, our community in Worcester learned that the goals of Act 46 included included increasing equity and opportunities and maximizing efficiencies. We're hearing similar language today in this next round. Washington Central in particular affirmed that the goal of Act 46 of, quote, increasing flexibility to manage, share, and transfer resources was important to us. And we were told that by creating a unified district, it would become easier to hire for things like allied arts because instead of individual schools hiring, employees would be district employees. We have not spent a lot of time reflecting much on whether we've seen the benefits of district level consolidation. And it's important to me to really understand how that is going as we're asked to make decisions on the next level of consolidation. Um, I'd like to request that the administration share the current staffing levels at all five elementary schools. I recognize it's an impossible time for staffing in schools across Vermont and the country, but, and it's also important for me to understand the data on how the first level of consolidation has successfully or not impacted equity of resources across our schools. For each of the five schools, how many positions are currently not filled? How many are filled by staff that may not be certified in that role? And how many positions in each school are filled by more than one person? As a Worcester resident and Doty parent, I know the status of Doty. It's not fully staffed and doing the best that it can. This may be the case across the district, but that information is not out there for me to know. It would benefit our communities in this next level of conversation about consolidation to understand our successes and shortcomings from the last round um, before we were asked to vote and trust in the efficiencies and equity that may or may not come from this next round. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And Noah. Noah Weinstein, Worcester. Um, I wanted to ask what the research suggests about some of the possible harms of closing our district's small schools, both to the students and the communities in which they reside. In order to explore this question, I'd like to share research cited in two articles I recently came across, both of which I've already shared with the board. The first article was in Education Week from June 2024 and was titled, The Harm of School Closures Can Last a Lifetime, New Research Shows. 
The article outlines a new study by Jay Kim, a PhD candidate in economics, who found that students who attend a school that closes during their K through 12 career have lower test scores along with worse attendance and behavior in the short term. In the long term, they're less likely than their peers to complete college and have a job, and their earnings tend to be lower. Kim found that the more economically disadvantaged students are, the more negatively they are affected by school closures. The second article first appeared in the Burlington Free Press in July of 2019. The article is titled, What Happens to a Community When a Rural School Closes? The article cites a 2019 study in which Cornell researchers found economic benefits for those living closer to schools. For each mile a village was further from a school, house values decreased by more than $11,000 and per capita income decreased by more than $1,000. Other economic impacts of school closings document the re in the research include losses in property tax revenues, public investment, population, and stunted economic activity. As we explore the potential pros and cons of consolidation on our students and communities, let us deeply consider the research regarding some of the possible harms. We are not the first community to face these challenges. Perhaps we can learn from the experiences of others and hopefully avoid mm. some of their mistakes. Thank you. Laila, can you hear me? Do you wanna? Okay, we have a timer. Go. Two minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, Lila Richardson from Worcester. Um, and tonight I'm reading comments from Marsha Hill, who's another Worcester resident who is unable to um, attend the meeting. So when I say I, it's Marsha. I continue to be concerned about what happens to the school building if Doty is closed. I do understand that it will be offered to the town, but that means the school district is essentially passing the cost of the building maintenance onto the town. It will help the district's bottom line and make Worcester worse. This is especially disturbing in Worcester because we have the lowest income in the district based on government figures for average household income. Consolidation meant that Worcester had to take on a share of the richer town's debts. Now we may also have to have the cost of maintaining the building shifted to us. This is a good example of what so often happens to poorer communities. Well, there are many wonderful things that any town might do with a quote unquote free building, virtually all of them would require significant renovations. It would mean considerable time and effort to brainstorm options and to actualize them. Whatever use it was put to would need to be something that made enough money to pay for itself. I frankly cannot see what would pay for itself without massive expense to change the space. Housing would require completely gutting and reconfiguring the building. Office space and maker space would also require significant renovation. It seems unlikely to me that there would be enough consistent demand for this from paying renters. Given that, I would vote against the town acquiring the building. What a waste. Yep. Then, all right. I, it would help if you could say how long the timer is. It seems like it must be a minute and a half now. It, it was a minute. Yeah. Okay. I did send uh, this uh, commentary to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Lila. Please thank Mimi for the comments. Uh, Caitlin? Hi. Uh, I wanted to begin with, though you've seen my face at these meetings many times now, 186 members of the community signed a letter submitted to the board July 19th, which said the school is the centerpiece of our town and our community forum in Worcester was well attended by over 100 community members, many of whom feel strongly that our school is important and is the centerpiece of our community. But tonight I wanted to discuss the pre-K program with you. Uh, in last night's committee meeting, our superintendent mentioned that for FY26, the pre-K program at Rummy is expected to have 20 students within a three elementary school model. From what I understand, having 19 or more students would necessitate, necessitate two classrooms. Could you clarify if these would be two full day classrooms when combined with community connections? And additionally, with Act 76 likely coming into effect in the 25-26 school year, what changes must be made to, uh, to those projected enrollment numbers? We should consider that more families might now opt for the program, which could mean that the current estimate of 20 students might be low. So how many students are expected for pre-K-3 and pre-K-4 under Act 76? and how many classrooms will be required in total. Back at the napkin math, uh, one classroom each for K through six, say for third grade, which we have been told needs two classrooms and two for pre-K, then nine available classrooms at Rumney will be overutilized. 
if Act 76 changes are implemented, will pre-K-3 still be available at all? And if so, will it also be offered as a full-time program with community connections? Would pre-K-3 need a separate classroom from pre-K-4 because of differences in funding? Uh, and then it's really crucial now that we're given detailed specifics about how each of the nine classrooms at Romney will be used, including which will be used for art, music, foreign language, and all the other promise expanded enrichment opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm trying to see, Carl. Uh, no, David, you're, you already went, so Carly? <laughs> Hi, hey, uh, this is Ryan Humke. Actually, I'm posing oh, as Carly. Yeah, oh, sorry, I think there was no visual, so I can't see that. Can you see me now? We can see you. Okay. I'm uh, be. I'm not speaking on behalf of Carly. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. Um, sorry, I I thought I was at the end of the queue, so I don't have my timer started. Uh, I will start it now. Thank you uh, to the board uh, for serving on behalf of their towns, taxpayers, and adolescent populations. I would love to believe that the school board is acting on the interests of all five towns in the district, but it doesn't feel that way. For years, Worcester has organized to maintain Jody Elementary School. New roof, new ventilation system, new heating system. We've poured a lot of money into this asset and to think that the school board would close it, would easily cast it aside, makes me think that I know this town better than the representatives here tonight who do not live in Worcester. I served on the uh, school board and put a lot of care into um, maintaining the building. We are seeing local control so slowly shift to decentralized, to centralized decision making. Where if reps from four towns want to leave one town out in the cold, they can. Quite simply, we saw Montpelier vote to shutter Roxbury's elementary school simply because Montpelier votes outweighed Roxbury's smaller population demographic. I didn't move to Worcester, the poorest of the five towns per capita, to be dictated to by a centralized school board. How that consolidation occurred is beyond me. If Worcester votes to close Doty, so be it. But already I've heard speculation that people in power with their vision in the forefront may seek a way around the Worcester vote should uh, the should we vote to keep Doty open. I'm out of time, so I'll um, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Say hi to the kids. Okay. So I, I <laughs> think you. a lot of these questions are going to be answered today, some uh, in the data, but uh, let's get moving into our next uh, piece of the agenda, which is our board learning. Yeah, I'm going to try to share my screen and sort of multitask at the same time. And let's see, share. I think I'm doing the right one. Oh, yeah. Oh, there it is. Right. Okay, and you'll be admitting. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So, sorry, where did it go? Oh. Just, just click on the screen. Can I just go yeah. here and move it like yeah. that? Okay. And hit slideshow. Oh, sorry. There we go. All right. Okay. Got it. Sorry, the technology there got me for a minute. So we're going to spend a, a, the presentation was included in your packet. So I'm not going to try to read every single uh, slide. I'm also going to try to leave a little bit of time for uh, for for questions. Uh, we started to talk a little bit about it a minute ago. And bear with me with technology because I'm not usually presenting here. But uh, we're going to do a quick overview of the key functions of the board, uh, one of our favorite um, sort of things that, that we say, or a lot of uh, people that talk about school board work say is like, we, I'm gonna try to keep us in the balcony through this, through this work. So we're looking down to the work. We're not that far away, but we're in the balcony. We're not in the trenches with our educators. So the overview of uh, the key roles of the board is for us to envision the future and set course, which we have been doing by setting our core beliefs and our vision and our mission. Be Questions? No, you okay. have it. It's yeah. not. It. It, it was in the packet. 
emailed to you. Email back. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it's just that long. We, I, we included in the packet that went out last Friday. There was a link there. I just, okay. we didn't print it because it's a lot of treats on behalf of our children. We did not print it, but so we can, so our other key board function is to create the conditions for students and staff to be successful. So our main, uh, our most important job is to hire a superintendent, which we did last year. Uh, we grown our own in our district, which is also good for our district. Uh, policy development and budget development are. The mic is not. Oh, the mic is not working. Can we also shift the screen that yeah, way? Yeah, we had it against. Percy, it, what? Come here. For us to yeah. Yeah. See it. Yeah. Come on. Close the door again. Uh, sorry, Spencer. Yeah, somebody said that. Yeah. Yeah, like Good it, girl. It, it just straight to the yeah. not to the board, to the board. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. It's uh, uh oh. So, oops. So set high expectations for our students learning, be accountable. Oops, now we are, um, oopsie. So I'll, I'll keep talking to you for seeing the, uh, be accountable for student learning through adopting and monitoring a system of continuous improvement. We were just working on that today with our quality. We have a monitoring system for our, how our students doing. Uh, we are also responsible for advocating on behalf uh, of all students in our, in our school. So, it's coming. So there's 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 ten domains or ten components of a functioning board. Can you hear me? Sorry. So it, this four domains is where I wanted to stay today, and especially in domain one and well, actually all through four. But a board readiness mindset and approach, it is really important that sort of was part of my opening, the mindset that we can that we need to have, you know, collaborative, solution oriented, and, and just be ready to do the work. So not coming to our meetings with our uh, an agenda, right? We all became board members because we all wanted to represent all our students. We're not coming here because we are representing just one agenda item. Uh, Strategic voice, so is the, the values and the and the vision. So so what we you know what what we value is what we hold our administrators and our district accountable, right? So what we choose to if we not choose, we try to stay center in our vision and our mission uh, through our work as a board. And operational guidance is uh, is our other domain, uh, a board member guidance board. Um, board guidance and district guidance. So is how do we make it, we covered a little bit of this when we were at our retreat. So how do we how do we work as a board, right? So who responds to an email? I don't wanna go, because we went through some of that um, unless there is a big question on that, I'm not gonna go through that uh, right now, but we have just in a large for the public to know, we have a steering committee that was created so that we wouldn't have just a, you know, a, a chair that could be, you know, I don't, I don't know, King or queen or whatever whatever it is, but we we have a steering committee so that we have a shared responsibility through that steering committee to help create the agenda and make sure that we are on on track and we're representing what what is in our work plan. We have a work plan so that we stay focused on the work of the board for that year, so that we try to not add new items into our agenda that are not part of our work plan, so that we can do the work that we need to do in behalf of our district in a timely manner. Um, and in district guidance, uh, we have uh, uh, our administrators who we, who we, you know, through our superintendent, hire, our superintendent hires the best people so that our students can have, uh, you know, what, what they need to be successful as, as, a, as a learner. And, you know, success is really for us, uh, our core beliefs right now is what I would decry. So if our schools are inclusive, and welcoming of others and our kids are able to to learn that's what we that's that's what we want to do so we hold accountability the district accountability and we try to make accountability be not scary but accountability by a growth mindset right we and our only person that we evaluate is our superintendent right and then the superintendent is in charge of the rest of the district 
Yeah. So the essential work of school boards, it, all new members, and Julia, you will get one, all members have uh, get a, a book from the Vermont School Boards Association, and this is, we got the slides, we put the slides together from that book. So we create a vision for education for our community, we establish policies, and that's how we, through the policies, uh, how we carry our work. The first task of the school board and is defined in statute is the policies are designed to establish the district priorities, what community values might impact how you carry out the program, what limitations do you want to put on administration. We are not a policy governance uh, district. We are we we govern by policies, but we're not a policy governance district. Policy governance puts ends, and we tell the superintendent what he can't do, and he has the freedom, and then he reports on that end, and we wouldn't be having all this smaller conversations that we're having right now. Um, we hired a superintendent to provide leadership and to manage the district. We just talked a little bit about that. We monitor the progress towards the vision, and we monitor that progress, like the work that we do in the ed quality uh, committee. So I'm going to keep going. Develop and adopt a budget to support the vision and assure a sound financial oversight. Uh, so uh, as a board, we provide uh, budget parameters. Uh, and how does the budget reflect our vision and reflect our values of the district? So I think there's a couple of you that haven't been through, a, can you, I think three people haven't been through a budget cycle through us. So we could, we, we are going to learn about that at our next meeting. We're going to do a budgeting uh, learning with Suzanne, and we will go. We will go through the through not just the process, but how we set the parameters as a district. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one. Uh, oops. <clears throat> so then we, after we develop the, and adopt the budget to support the vision and assure of sound and financial oversight, uh, the board needs to provide the overall guidance to the budget priorities. And how does the budget reflect the vision and the values of the district? We engage the community in the support of the education of our students. I'm just going to keep going because some of that you have. So the two things that uh, we're not going to cover at the next uh, at the next meeting, but that I want you to have a, at least a, a little bit of an um, overview is that. There are board surplus duties that support the overall operations of our board. So we are a quasi judicial function. We have some areas where we have student hearings, for example. We have already established process for that. We we will send information ahead of time. We have a, a student manual, a student manual that has the procedures. We, as a board, we, we, we sit together, it's confidential, and we will share with you and have a training before we have a, a, a student hearing. But all of that it will be part of our learning together. A collective bargaining, we have a committee that is in charge of negotiations, and that is another one of our roles. We have, just last year, we finalized a three-year agreement, so the committee is right now active just in the um, the scale, I'm looking at Diane right now in, in matrix. the matrix, yeah. So here at, do you want to do the duties of the superintendent? <laughs> I'm learning these each day. Yeah. Um, so the, the duties of the superintendent is to carry out your policies is the number one thing for me. Um, and to identify the educational goals and objectives that we'll bring to the board. Um, I'm also, as a superintendent, responsible for rec recommending for employment or dismissal of uh, persons uh, for, our, for our staff. And um, as we did in our uh, Ed Quality Committee, we furnish data. And it's when we say duties of the superintendent uh, or his or her designee um, <laughs> also comes into play in all of that. So, uh, so I have a wonderful team that helped me meet these uh, duties as well. And, uh, and, and overall, my job is to make sure that we have general supervision and and that means making sure that we are um, observing classes and uh, and checking on what's going on in the schools from the administrative standpoint. And the principal's answer to you, so I let you. So yeah, if you think about it as a structure, I'm re I'm really responsible for the principals and making sure that they are um, that the supervision of the principals, and that's really. Don't think of that as just the evaluation, but helping them develop as the leaders that they are in each of the schools so that they can then turn around and work with the teachers who are working with the kids. So 
it's really about the kids at the very um, end of that process, but they're what drive all of the work um, from the teachers to the principals to the superintendent. Thank you. So in here you can see clearly what our board's domain is. You know, the board sets goals and policies and the board judge accessibility, uh, acceptability and performance. So we are up in the balcony. Uh, the management domain, you can see it before, uh, before under here, is strategic plan modification, superintendent uh, interpretation of the, of the data, delegation uh, by the superintendent to appropriate personnel, like he was saying, uh, implementation of the supervision and revision if required, and that would be uh, yeah, like our strategic plan, right? This is a general, you know, I'm using a, a table that is general for a lot of boards, so it doesn't necessarily reflect just what we do. Uh, like today, we the performance of data gathering. Gathering today, Jen shared with us the data, you know, through our quality committee, and monitoring our reports. Whether that report is a financial report, a report from our policy committee, or a report from a Ed quality committee. And oops, I think that's. Can I get to the last of that one? So I wanted to open it for questions. We have a, we would be sending the, the link and we order, we, some of our board members did this uh, with us before. We read the book uh, all together. We order more copies. Uh, they just haven't arrived and we fear that this would be a good way to bring us together again. There's, we can go deeper for some board members and we can bring other new board members into just to stay in ground that it will help us get stay grounded in our monitoring of how students are doing, but also helps us in, as we're working through the strategic plan to achieve our goals, because our kids don't have a year to lose, right? We need to lead with that in mind. Um, so with that, uh, there's a, in your, in the work plan, you know, you guys all have access to the work plan, and that's how you stay informed on what the next themes are, or if you want to uh, you know, if you have any questions, you can always email Stephen or email myself with with any questions. And uh, please sign up for uh, continuing learning through the Vermont School Association. You can either do the webinars, you get the emails, or you can join the new uh, board members in, uh, training. It already started, but you can join it. On Thursday is the regional meeting for all board members. And there's gonna be uh, some presentation on the district quality standards, which we talked a little bit at our, uh, our retreat. So I will encourage you, if you still have time to sign in for, it's at 5.30 tomorrow. 5.30 to 7.30 is the regional meeting, both uh, uh, we'll do a little presentation on the, on, on the governance standards, and there will also be a, a little a presentation by um, Courtney and Jill from the AOE in what are going to be the monitor. They, they have created a rubric on how they will know if we're meeting or not meeting the, the governance st standards. And I think that's it. I'll stop sharing. That would be helpful so we can see everybody. Thank you. Okay. It, so any questions that was that was a lot we were trying we haven't been able to do onboarding this was the easiest way to onboard and have previous board members part of that Natasha. um i'm wondering not maybe not so much for us but for the community if you could go a little bit more into when community members communicate with board members how that those communications get answered because we as individual board members get emails um but the answers don't necessarily come back from us so yeah. if you could kind of clarify that for the community just what that yeah, process yeah, yeah. is like so as a as, as a board we have a, it's not a policy but we have best practices so usually when you send an email to the entire board the chair replies uh, with the voice of the board hopefully that's what she's you know what she's doing so the chair replies to those uh, to those emails. If you get a, if you send an email directly to one a one board member, most board members usually like check in and then they reply and copy both the superintendent and myself. And that's mainly not to micromanage, it's mainly so that we all know how we're moving forward and we can all have a united voice in 
in, in our district, right? Because we're all working together. There has been a lot of emails recently because we are in the configuration part. And like I, I didn't reply to Michaela's because I didn't have all of the answers yet. I replied to Natasha's. And today uh, we will be sending a lot of those questions that were answered in those last two emails are going to be answered by some of the data that we'll be presenting today. So tomorrow I can send those those answers because they asked they were asked directly to them, but they ask us to because we didn't have the, the all of the answers. But the board the board makes a decision for the community to know that when the board makes a decision, we speak as one voice. And when we put updates in our in in front porch forum, or when we put a, or when I come and welcome the staff this Monday, this past Monday before school started, I welcome the staff on behalf of the entire board, right? So we we speak as a unified uh, voice because when we make a decision, whether it is, like I said before, a divided decision, we stand behind that decision in behalf of all of our students. Does that cover it? But yeah. Also, we have that chart. Oh, and we have a new chart, and we put we're just gonna use it once a month. So it's in our third <laughs> month, and we 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 had our meeting today, and we were adding with Melissa some two new emails that came in. So now we have, you know, where things are and the crossover of the, so correspondence, we have a charge for correspondence and we'll have a chart through the superintendent on previous subjects so that we know if we have something that we haven't, we haven't answered. And then we've been as, um, adding a lot of questions to our, um, not a lot, but uh, to our frequently asked questions. As the data becomes available and we have more, we, those, frequently asked questions are is a, is a live document, right? So it's not perfect yet, and hopefully we'll get it to almost perfection before there's any vote. And where's the chart being housed? In the website, the frequently asked questions, it's in the website. The first chart, you're gonna get it at our board meeting. Okay. It'll, it'll be a part of the, the packet. The packet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. So if all of these uh, letters that are sent to the entire, letters that are sent to the entire board, are those part of the public Record then? Yeah. They yeah. are. So are they available for members yeah. of the community to read in a central location? That's what we are doing now. Yeah, because before be they were on. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are, they're all labeled. And, and we even went to the extent to putting the answer of that. And, we, and they're going to be monthly. So it's not like we're going to try to, because there's communication sort of in, be, in between two. Mm -hmm. We're not going to try to monitor all of the little communication because also that wouldn't make it fair to the public either, right? Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants their e their little email sending, hey, excuse me, is this, uh, you know, where you keep, I don't know, X in the website, that is not a public record, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So we're trying to do especially create transparency around the, um, the consolidation part. So we even went ahead for for Dodi, for, for Dodi, we added in the data and you can see it in, even in our last packet. We've been keeping the two letters that Dodi sent as part of the data, part mm -hmm. of every mm -hmm. single meeting, so that doesn't get lost. So I hope that that is. So Thank you. Just for your sake, um, how would a member of the public know when the letter or email is going to be part of the public record and when it wouldn't be? Is there a criteria that we say, you need to tell us that you want it to be part of the record, um, or is there a link um, that goes into it, or? Because some people may want these small emails to be part of the public record. Well, and when I said in small email, yeah. everything is part of, you know, once you email the board, everything's public, okay. right? So as you know, because okay. you've asked before for stuff, yeah. you know, everything that comes to the board members, that's another thing that we didn't cover. Use your board address. All new board members, please use your board address because you're, you know, if your request of information is forward to the board, you need to submit all your emails. It's easier to keep track if you use your board, your board address. So we, if it's a, so to answer your question, what I yeah. meant little emails is yeah. that sometimes we get a little request like, you know, where do you keep, it? you know, how do I find the packet on the website? Mm -hmm. it, and then you put a, how do I, uh, you know, how do I contact who's so-and-so's address because I need to contact or, or or there's a question to you know like little question like that's what I mean but all of the configuration especially questions yeah. or big emails are coming are going directly okay. uh, and forwarding to Melissa and being added to that Thank you. Okay. all right so now let's move we're a little behind but I think it's you yeah it is. Okay. all right 
second to share my screen. Oh, there it is. So the, first of all, thank you to our um, configuration committee for yesterday's meeting. I know we're kind of really turning things around pretty quickly, but um, it's helpful to have questions asked that we can try to bring an answer. I will also, full disclosure, could not answer all of the questions in the, um, the 24 hours since we just met. I did sleep for part of those. So. Um, so we did that. Um, I just really appreciate um, the work that we're doing right now. Um, it's important. Um, it's necessary for us to have these conversations. And I just want to remind us that part of what brought us to this moment in time for the configuration questions what were the questions around rising cost, um, the declining enrollment uh, across the district, a need for financial sustainability for our district. And I just um, I just really appreciate us being able to have a conversation about our student needs and uh, and try to figure out what we can do with our system to meet those needs. Um, so a lot of the data that we have talked about is we've got studies that go back all the way to 2010. Um, and as part of our uh, timeline, those documents are available to anybody. I shared this um, slideshow with the public so that you have it um, in the chat. And, um, and then we'll, I'll keep adding at the bottom of this any of these presentations as we go through them so that we're able to see that. Um, the criteria, this is the adaptation of um, our criteria as the, the committee has expanded on that. And so um, they're, they're uh, some of those pieces that we'll try to answer tonight as part of it. And just a reminder of the goals of our strategic plan. So we have three goals that we're going to try to keep um, front and center and try to meet in the next uh, several years for us. And so um, one of the questions that had come up uh, pretty repeatedly was uh, the definition of equity. Um, we do have a board policy around that. That's linked at the bottom of this slide. Um, that's board policy C29 around equity. Um, but we also, um, I've, I've included the Vermont Agency of Education definition. It's very broad, um, but that every student will have access to the educational resources and rigor they need at the right moment in their education across all of those categories that are listed there. Our board policy is a little, little more specific than this one, um, so I would just uh, point people towards that if they were wondering how does the board address some of those. And then I also included, um, as a leadership team, we've been working towards what does it mean to have inclusion within our school system, um, and that is that students have equitable access to classrooms with grade level peers, equitable access to grade level content, high expectations, and feeling of hope and belonging. Um, this is from Katie Novak. Um, we have not formalized our own definition, but this is a really good working um, uh, way for us to look at this. She has provided training to administrators and teachers throughout our state and throughout the country, actually. Um, she's pretty well regarded for um, Universal Design for Learning, which is an educational, um, I, well, it's a, it's a whole lot of educational stuff. <laughs> Um, that she uh, she works on. And so this was the definition. I just wanted to make sure that we kind of had a little piece of that as well. And then I also just want to point to our equity indicators. Um, this is the work that we started last year. The very first time was last year that we did this equities indicator work where we reported on um, quite a few different areas. Um, there are a lot of asterisks in this chart that are things that we do not have. We didn't have them back um, at the towards the end of last year, and we haven't done them in the first few days of this year. Either. So um, this is work that we still have to do to see, are we meeting the equity um, challenges of, of our district and our students? And so this, I just wanted to ground us back in that work as well. Is there a sense on when those estimates will be available? Um, it will be throughout the year, probably I would say the next two years. This will be tied into our strategic planning goals as well. Okay so that we can get those because we're going to need to i think uh, social emotional learning is a good example we're just now implementing a way to measure that and so we'll have training with our teachers and be able to move that forward yeah. and so i pulled uh pulled together some current data and research for our district so that we can see um, this was um, a question around enrollment numbers um, so i just tried to give you um, a little look back at physical year 15 i have the enrollment numbers for our district I need to point out that the left hand column has a total pre K through six, and the right hand one is just K six because those are projections. 
um, just just so you know we're not completely looking at apples to apples on that but you can see that um, our enrollment at Rumney um, was 177 kids back in fiscal year 15 that actually wasn't their high point um, in terms of enrollment um, and one of the things that I wanted to, to use this to point out when our enrollments were as high as they are on the um, fiscal year 15 um, there were no issues about schools being overcrowded or having too many students or anything like that that were being brought up at the time. Um, and so I just point that out because combining, when we talk about the three um, uh, elementary school model, when we talk about combining them, our school numbers are not going to be a great deal larger. Um, uh, East Montpelier will be a little bit, but Rumney will almost be the same size um, if we were to combine Rumney and Doty as it was back in physical year 15. And so we were running a school at that time that was not considered overcrowded. Um, we also have our, um, our projected enrollments from physical year 27 to 32. Um, what I was trying to just show there is that it looks like that we start to finally level out with our enrollment. Um, with that. And so you can kind of see there is no spike in enrollment that is shown during that time that's based on birth rates and um, and also projected uh, birth rates within the district. So when you look at those, this comes from NESDEC. The full data is down there at the bottom where it says NESDEC 2022. So you can look at that and see um, see more specific data, but there is no significant increase in the number of students once we uh, reach that about 600 kids in K-6, and about the same in 7-12. How um, confident is NESDEC in their, in their numbers? They give, do they give error bars? I think I have something similar. There, there's not a huge error bar. So actually, I, I tried to do a little look at back from when we had the fiscal year 15 data, what yeah. did it say about fiscal year 25, where we sit right now? We weren't off by more than, I would say, 30 kids um, when you look back at what they were projecting. And so we weren't... They're, they're pretty good with their numbers. Um, I will say one of the questions that had come up was the, um, about Berlin doing some uh, building. Um, we reached out. There are only 30 units being planned for the first phase of the building project, and those are mixed size. So we're, we would not predict a tremendous number of students coming out of that first phase of building with the new town center. And so we, we looked into that as well because um, that was there. So it gives you a little little view on where we are, where we've been, and where, where we may be going with our enrollment. Um, those numbers tend to be pretty good. Um, this was another question about, this is the current staffing of our schools. I know that question came up. Uh, there are open positions. We'll be reporting on that in the next Colt report, where we are with our open positions. Um, but they are spread across, across the district. Um, this, is the, this is what's in the budget. To this is what we... Um, this is the people that we employ right now. That is not from the budget. Okay. This is the number of people that we have in the district. Um, as of yesterday, um, you're oh, going to approve some more people uh, today. So we're, we're going to increase this by a few. Um, but yeah, we're, that, that gives you a look at where we are right now with our staffing. So, are these below budgeted numbers? Yes. Yes, because we do have open positions. Wait, and I'm sorry, well, Stephen. So, and also the non-bargaining ESP is that like maintenance and cooks? Or that is a lead maintenance and um, the admin assistance to the principal. Because I know the question had come up under ESP. How many of that is yeah. educational? And how many is that um, uh, building? Yeah, and and we're still going to work on breaking that out when we talk about the budget. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it'll be easier for us to do then. Yep, and so. That gives a view there. Um, Patrick, I took your chart and I expanded on it just a little bit. So, um, so Patrick had offered a, what, how are we looking at our building usage? Um, I actually, um, the low end of the optimal class size, we used an average of uh, 14.875, I think was what we used. Uh, for the up, the high end of optimal, let me just make sure I get the right number, we used 20.6, um, just to give us an average for the number of classrooms that we have of how many kids. 
that's using the, we had used kind of an optimal class size based on research of 13 to 18 kids for the, um, for the lower grades and um, what was it, uh, 20 to 25? 25. Yeah, for the, for the older. Ed quality says 25 or less. We're not going to go to 30. Um, I know that that was a number that was thrown out there. But what this shows is that each of the schools and the number of classrooms that we reported, and please recognize those are the teaching classrooms that doesn't include art, music uh, classrooms necessarily. Um, some of those teaching spaces, we can get more detailed about the building if we need to. Um, but if you use the high end of optimal, so if our class sizes are at the upper end of what we consider optimal class size, um, we have some space within our schools. Um, so you can see that we're not fully utilizing our schools based upon those numbers. Mm -hmm. Although fiscal year 26, Jody and Romney puts them at 185, so it's like right there. Yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it would put them closer. Well, it would put them towards the high end of optimal, right. I'm just pointing it out. Mm -hmm. Which is still class sizes of you know, a maximum of 18 students in the lower grades. Yeah. What did you say, Michaela? Just as long Yep. This is this is why we're presenting the data so that we can look at it. All right. Um, and then um, those were kind of our our pieces of just what are the demographics and what are the buildings holding. Um, I have my other designees over here. Um, so Jen and Julie are going to help us uh, talk through some of the curriculum and special education services that we have. And so um, Jen, I'm going to turn that over to you. You're going to need a mic. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Okay, at the end, it's public comment. It's about, sorry. It's about yeah. the numbers in here that don't I, match. Yeah, I will we'll get you okay. at the end. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to put my back to anyone. If I write it down, write it down. All right. So um, I wanted to remind the board and the public of a few things. The first is that we have articulated our standards for graduation from pre-kindergarten through graduation, uh, content standards and transferable skills, all of which are aligned to the national standards as agreed upon and articulated at the Vermont Agency of Education. And so in some cases, we have articulated performance indicators grade level by grade level. And in other cases, we have done them in grade level clusters in alignment with those national standards. So for example, in global citizenship, our standards are uh, for first and second grade together, third and fourth grade together. So that's something to, to be thinking about. Um, another piece is the importance of evidence-based layer one instruction, and this is especially as we are articulating um, our students' uh, expectations and needs in our multi-layered system of supports and thinking about uh, Act 173. It's important to bear this in mind. Act 173, often people think about as Vermont's new special ed law. Actually, uh, Act 173 is a lot more about what is happening in excellent first instruction and then in layers of intervention before a student might be referred for specialized instruction. And so two of the commitments that we've made um, in order to enact our commitment to an obligation to, um, to implement evidence-based layer one instruction are, are programs that are by grade level. So our math program, those of you on Ed Quality Committee just saw a report, um, that is a grade by grade math program. And, um, and then our foundations program for our early literacy work, kindergarten through third grade, is articulated grade by grade. And we have situations right now that are not straight grades, and so we deploy personnel in different ways to essentially split classrooms so that we can implement those programs the way that they are intended to be implemented so that we can implement them with fidelity. So that's one thing that's important to know. In terms of um, kindergarten through sixth grade curriculum maps, we established those curriculum maps in the summer of 2023 in alignment with the national standards 
for both global citizenship and science. And another important thing to know is that sometimes I forget, I'll say, oh, curriculum camp, like you all know what I'm talking about, and you don't. And so I wanna slow that down a little bit. Um, curriculum camp is a professional learning opportunity that we offer in the summer. We invite teachers who are interested to come and join us and engage in work that's gonna further our coordinated curriculum work in the district. So we had been really focusing hard on literacy and math for a number of years. And, and neglecting global sit and science. In the summer of 2023, we were able to focus on global citizenship and science for K through six. We articulated um, our expectations for units of study aligned to the national standards and our performance indicators. Um, one thing right now is, again, we're, we are, they're aspirational right now. We're working toward full implementation as we've articulated them. And sometimes our configurations aren't aligned the way that we've articulated our units of study. So it's important to know that um, right now, when we have units of study that are uh, for global citizenship, for example, for first and second grade, we can operate those on a two year cycle. And then when we operate a second, third grade combination, we just get out of cycle and out of whack. And Often it takes a little bit of time for us to then figure out, or we'd have to project in the future, how to, how to write that to ensure that our kids all have the foundation and some ex common experiences. I think the other thing is, speaking of multi-age, in some cases, and, and for decades actually, there have been some places, schools in our district that have made a commitment to multi-age for philosophical reasons. Back in the day, I was a teacher in this district in a multi-age classroom, and I attended a graduate course about best practices in multi-age education and teaching. Um, and in some cases, we are we're creating multi-age classes because we are responding to, as you heard Alicia say, for example, uh, dynamics in a classroom and opportunities or blips and in enrollment. And so what uh, um, operating fewer schools with more children would allow us to intentionally decide what is it that we're gonna do to ensure that our students are meeting our outcomes. Um, and I just wanna see, and again, I would say just to reiterate, um, it would cre create some stability in the system that doesn't exist in terms of our ability to fully implement um, the curriculum, in my opinion. The about the curriculum camps could they take into into account what the predicted enrollment might be and then and then map uh, map the one two three fours um, uh, classrooms along along with that. Um. I mean, I don't want to say no, but I do want to say that's not the purpose of curriculum camp. Curriculum camp is that opportunity to engage in professional learning, mapping out how we're going to meet our kids' needs and deploy our staffing is more an administrative responsibility is how I would answer that question. Not impossible, but not really the purpose of, of that work. It is an invitation that goes to our teachers to participate, and they get paid to come and participate. They're not volunteering their time, but they are deciding to participate or not. No, it's not mandatory. No. Um, is it useful if teachers have to attend curriculum camp? Um, I don't think that I would want to enforce mandatory curriculum camp. I think we get the work done. We are really productive because people who have the time, space, energy, and passion about engaging in the work come together across the district, and we get so much done in just a few days. I think that's the richness of the experience is that people are opting into that experience in service to the district. So is there a way then that that experience and the benefits of it filters out to other staff members? The, the point of the work is to further our district work in coordinated curriculum. So the decisions that we are making and the work that we're doing, we then work toward implementing across the entire district. Yeah. I have a question. Sorry, Jen. Um, going back to the changing class configurations, yeah. I'm curious, um, just a rough thought on your end, but 
um, how much of the changing class configurations is um, staffing instability, like our staffing shortage that we're experiencing, and how much of it is enrollment, if you could estimate kind of percentage, if that makes any sense. I am not aware of a decision that we've made, and I'd look to my colleagues here. I'm not aware of a decision that we've made related to how we're going to configure staff or classrooms for kids that's related to staffing or a staffing shortage. I am aware that we are looking at numbers and dynamics and making decisions that we think are in the best interest of our students based on our student population in need. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. And so um, Julie is going to, our director of special uh, student, uh, support student support services. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I, the, the title throws me. Um, she's going to, uh, to give you some information about our service delivery for special education. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, as we look at the possible changes in configuration, um, our our superintendent last year, Megan Roy, was someone with ex exceptional amount of experience in special education. She and Suzanne looked at this. Suzanne, I looked at it again, and it really doesn't look like if we were to change to the three elementary school model that's currently being discussed, that we would, in the short term, see any real cost savings, um, or it is at, at least very difficult to predict. I was. Um, I presented a little bit of information last night with the finance committee and one of the points I made then was that in our smaller schools what tends to happen around specialized instruction is that it can be difficult to form groups or to have a group size for students to learn together if a student requires specialized instruction and therefore the special educators tend to do a little bit more one-to-one -one service. That brought the question, what is the difference between one-to-one -one instruction versus small group, and what would be the advantages and disadvantages? So I added a little bit more information to this slide. Both models have pros and cons, and the best approach tends to depend on the needs of the individual student. I can't say every student should have one or the other. Um, one-to-one -one tutoring allows for focused support, as you can well imagine. It can also limit social learning. It can be a bit more stigmatizing, and it can stunt peer relationships. Small group also can allow for more targeted instruction than large group, help students learn to collaborate, allow students to practice new skills with peers, and students are more likely to be engaged and participate than in large groups. I also referenced last night something called the Vermont DMG report. That was a district management group it was an extensive study of special education services and how we deliver them in the state of Vermont that was conducted in 2017. So I, I put a link into this that you can access the report. It's 71 pages. Um, I tried, I think, weekly last night in our finance group to highlight some of the practices that I think were being encouraged as a part of that study and others to implement in our special education service delivery. And it's, it's really hard. It's a complex thing. And to do that for all of you in this little bit of time is just not easily done. So please see that report if you're interested. The other thing I want to be sure to do is to say to the community and to the board that whatever the decision is made around configuration, we will continue to do all we can to support our students with needs in the best way possible. And um, each student is very individual in their needs, and that's our goal is to meet that individual student's needs. The other point I think is important for the board to know is that whatever is best for our general education students, all students, will also elevate the scores of our students with disabilities. That's proven over and over again. So all the work that you're doing now to talk about what is our best practice will have an excellent effect on our students who need additional support as well. I was also asked after last night's presentation to talk a little bit about what if we move to a three elementary school model? What might be some of the constraints and opportunities with our current configuration? And what might be constraints and opportunities with the proposed configuration? This is by far, <laughs> it's a long ways from exhaustive, but it gives you a sense of some of the things that I think align with the DMG report. One of the constraints we currently have is that our small school special educators um, support students in grades K through six. So they're serving students in seven grade levels. 
there may be one to two students eligible for special education in each grade level, which means that they're consulting with general educators at multiple grade levels across multiple content areas and multiple grade levels. It also gives them generally pretty limited opportunities for small group specialized instruction because to find students with like needs is just harder when you have a smaller group. Um, one of the real nice opportunities I think a lot of people value is consistency of case manager over the years. Those relationships can become really valuable to people. When it's not working, it's really hard. <laughs> but when it's great, it's great. And it can be really hard to let go of that. In the proposed configurations of the three elementary school model, um, certainly one constraint would be less consistency of case management over the years. At the high school, for example, or the middle school and high school, at the middle school, you may have the same case manager for two years, but odds are you'll have a different case manager than 9 through 12, as example. One of the opportunities that, that um, could come about if we were to move to the three elementary school model would be reduced travel time for our specialists. Currently, our early childhood special educators are split between schools and sometimes just aren't at the one that's having the challenging moment at the time they need to be there. Our school psychologists travel between all um, six buildings and spend considerable time on the road. And in fact, we're in my office just this morning saying, um, that they, you know, that that can be a challenge around their work and other staff like our occupational therapists. The other um, piece I think, Diane, you asked me a little bit about last night was sort of what might happen if we were to move to this model. And so a this, this could provide a narrower focus for our special education services and supports and result in increased efficiency. For example, currently at East Montpelier, there are three special educators each are serving three grade levels and are focusing on a specific area of student need. Adding a four special educator will allow for a narrower focus, obviously maybe two grade levels, or focusing, for example, in the area of autism or reading and another in the area of math. Likewise at Rumney, we currently have two special educators there serving four grade levels each. Adding a third special educator will allow them to focus on two to three grade levels and or to specialize again instructionally. So they're just some things related to special education for your consideration. Yes. Daniel, I had a couple questions. Um, so early childhood special educators cover pre-K to second or pre-K to third? Just pre-K. Pre and we currently have two. Okay. And one, um, Berlin and Callis is one split, and Romney and, um, what's the other one? Dodie? No. No. East Montpelier, East thank Montpelier. you, is the other. And then how many school psychologists and OTs? We currently have two school psychologists, and they conduct evaluations across all six schools. Um, OTs, we have three. Our speech and language pathologists, um, for example, we have a full-time person here at um, U32. Um, but others are generally split between buildings. What is ECS? East? That's the early childhood special educators. That's okay. Sometimes called Triple E. Chris, did you have a question okay. as well? Um, how is it determination made for a student to participate in a small group versus one to one? Where does that decision originate? The decision is made by their educational team, the individualized educational team um, that comes about once a student is determined to be eligible for special education. There are a team of people that are connected with that student, their parent, their general educator, special educator, who make the decision as to what type of services would be most beneficial depending on the student's individual needs. Yes, most definitely, yeah. Generally, um, there tend to be more opportunities with small group, um, and students get to generalize, and they get to work together, and, and that's um, generally more fun for students, but it completely depends on the individual, individual students. Um, decisions that are made in IEPs are only changed when that IEP team reconvenes to make a decision. Can you guys use the mic? Sorry, I just had a sure. comment. Yeah, 
So my question is about ratios. Um, how do you determine how many educators per children in a school? So I'm thinking about Callis, for example, we have one, one special educator, we might have more, but I, I know of one who's amazing um, for all of our kids. And then I am looking at EMES, they have like the three. So what is, what is the standard that you follow or the ratio that you follow to determine how many educators per child in the school? And by educators, I think you mean special educators. Yes, yes. correct. Yes. Um, there's a lot of discussion about caseload size and there are different studies and different recommendations. In Vermont, an average caseload size tends to run between 14 and 18 students, um, depending on how many grade levels um, a, an educator is supporting, as well as the complexity of need of a particular student. So some districts choose to weight their caseloads. Um, we've decided not to do that here because um, we believe that it's difficult to categorize children under those circumstances. So we, um, we have not done that here. Um, we do, you know, sometimes convene team meetings. Um, we try to create equitable caseloads. And sometimes if things are off or a person is struggling because there's been a higher need than we anticipated, we regroup, we assess, and are we able to meet all the needs that are in the IEP? And if we're not, then we um, problem solve that and figure out how to meet the needs. And that sometimes means asking for additional staff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I've shown this uh, graphic the, the first time around, um, so a couple of weeks ago, but this is our current elementary classroom configuration. I do not have that broken out by which school they're at, um, but that was asked um, actually um, and uh, for the proposed, if we went to three schools, um, some, they wanted to see what was the breakdown there. Um, East Montpelier, Middlesex, or Berlin, EMB, uh, you can see which class goes with which ones there. So you can kind of see um, this was the proposal. I'm going to go back to, the, to the, this current year configuration. And I had pointed out to the committee last night, and I just, I, I, it's, this is not, uh, I don't want to attach any value to it. But it's uh, just an observation that we have most of our fifth and sixth graders are together in combined classes. And if we were to make the decision to move the sixth grade to U32, it's that group of kids, the fifth and current fifth and sixth graders. So the, for the most part, those kids are already together. It's, there are definitely, there's one fifth and one sixth grade classes, but most of those students are already together in classes. And so they would move together as a whole to U32. It would be, and we'll talk a little more about the middle school programming in just a minute, but just, it's an observation if that were the decision that we make. Can you talk to the mic? Sorry, oh, okay. you were oh. the one that specifically they asked. <laughs> observation that suggests the transition would be easier? I, I think we could at least plan for it better. I don't know that it would be easier. I don't want to, you know, qualify it that way, but I think that our planning around that movement, we're, we would be, to be able to target those classes um, for the transition. So. It's all, it could be a little, um, it just could be easier in terms of just um, getting to the kids. Yeah, yeah, they're going to come with their cohort, right? So, and, and that was just, I, honestly, I hadn't noticed that until, until I put the data together for this one. I was like, oh, that could, that could help us in the transition should we choose to do that. Um, and then there's the, the, the three school configuration classroom that, that we put up there, that's something that we had shared with the board back with configuration. Um, and I would just point out that this is 34 classrooms now. That would be 29 classrooms next year. That also is under the assumption that the sixth grade came to U32. So that you can see where the, the different classes. Yes. I just did the quick math. And um, right now we're using 34. On the first slide, 34 of the classrooms. Yes. Did I miscount? No. Oh. On the next slide, we're using we're using 20. You're, you're envisioning a 29 classroom scenario. Yep. Which is using 10 out of 13 Berlin classrooms, 12 out of 15 East Montpelier classrooms, mm -hmm. and seven out of nine Roman classrooms. This does not include pre-K. Just so we're just. And the number of classrooms and building usage. 
which one of those classrooms is designated for pre-k it would be designated for pre-k should that be our configuration there was also the comment that um if you look at that at uh, middle sex the 23 in first grade there had been the comment of that potentially being split out or something which would then be another rule so i think that was some of the conversation last night. Yeah, so, yeah, last teacher. so I think this is a good good point to make here is that that would be a decision that we would put at the school level about what's best for those kids. That's mm -hmm. not the superintendent's not going to know enough about those kids to say that this is how it should be. Um, that's a, a school level decision as to what would be right for our kids. But to that point, Stephen, is, is, our, is our, it's our responsibility as a board and yours as a superintendent to, to make um, make it possible to be within the guidelines, is that correct? And then the principal would decide, I think the 20, is 23 outside the guidelines, and so is that inappropriate to even so, suggest? So we actually don't, I mean, the guidelines are there for us as a reference. They're not, um, they're not a policy okay. for those guidelines, I think would be the way okay. to say. So we, we have a policy of class size, if that's what you're asking mm -hmm. for. And then the superintendent, and there's a memo, I, I believe I sent it to everybody. There's a memo that we've been putting in our frequently asked questions. And in that memo, our previous superintendent, because Stephen was not there, he would be doing the same thing this year. Once he gets the numbers, he would be doing that recommendation of that class size yeah, we'll, with their cohort of kids. We'll be doing a report on class sizes as they stand right now. The, this, this slide gives you the elementary class sizes but it does not show you the middle and high school. Yeah. Right. So can you call just one second, because Ursula was waiting to ask a question and then sat. I realize mine's a curiosity one, so I'm just going to pause. OK. OK, so I just wanted to clarify that, that so each of us is still a guideline, not a right. Correct. Okay. Correct. Not policy. Not policy, yeah. It's a state. It's a Correct. This is state, yeah. I think it's also worth noting that EQS governs based on an average. So when mm -hmm. they say an average of 20, that's if you're putting out an average, you're assuming some above and some below. Correct. And it's a guideline that the guidelines are given to us for a reason, right? So that we can use them. Mm -hmm. So I do not know exactly how we've got it into the budget now. We're working on that this week as well. well but yeah, this is what this this is the staffing that we would recommend. Yeah, exactly. All right. Whoop, go ahead. Um, are you going to be able to? And, and if you said this already, I apologize. It's good. Are you going to be able to give us a breakdown of what rooms would look like, including special areas? Because this is just grade level classrooms, mm -hmm. but also there's art, there's music, there, you mm -hmm. know. So could we also get that? And then also, I know this does have the pre-K numbers, but also just like, is it just going to be one classroom for pre-K three and pre-K four? Is it one classroom for each? You know. I hear you. So we can really yep. That'll that'll probably be easier through the budget as well because we'll talk about personnel with that. Great. Do you have a question? I just wanted maybe a little clarification when Natasha said what it looks like. Are you talking number of, of students in like, I just want for my understanding, like how I those classrooms look. I how many classrooms are in the building and how they're being utilized. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's, what I, I'm for. That, mm -hmm. that's what I understood. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ursula. All right. Um, so we had the question was, what's our baseline? Um, for instruction. And so um, several years ago, our elementary principals, um, along with Jen, um, uh, sat down and talked about how many minutes per day and how many days per week um, would we ideally, right, want to, uh, to do these activities. So literacy, which includes a variety of things, so phonics, word study, reading, writing, all kinds of things there, you can see those. Um, math, several things, science and global citizenship. Um, never the, we had a reference to this in our um, mm -hmm. our EQS. Yeah, I think it, I think it would be good for everybody to hear. Um, is that science and global citizenship? You see, that's five days a week for twenty five minutes. That um, we will talk about in the next slide what that actually looks like in our schools. 
And then there was an agreement that we would try to have art, music, PE, health, and library. Got that in as well. Uh, five days a week for 45 minutes. So you can kind of see how the breakdown is for this. Right, this is the ideal. And then the actual, what does it look like? Um, so morning meeting typically lasts for 20 to 30 minutes in the elementary schools. The literacy block um, will include, um, will be five days a week. And four or five days a week, it, there's 30 minutes that's given to foundations, which is the uh, phonics program in our schools, but 80 to 120 minutes of, uh, of class time in our schools, that's the range. Math, five days per week, 90 minutes a day. We're pretty close to that mark that we had set. 60 minutes in kindergarten for a couple of the schools. And then this was the comment around science and global citizenship. There was nothing consistent across the elementary schools. They do it differently at each one. Some of them will do a half day eco program and eco is uh, educating children outdoors. It's a program that's through the nature center. Yep. So, um, and so that would be half day once a week. And I would also say that our teachers do a good job of integrating science and uh, global citizenship concepts within their reading and literacy work as well. So just because they don't have the, um, the time set aside for just straight science, they will use science concepts in their literacy um, blocks as well. So, so there's that piece. But this is a, as was pointed out in our EQS conversation, this is giving a short shrift to some of our science and global citizenship um, uh, standards and, and student learning outcomes. And so there's, there's work to be done around this uh, to make sure that all of our kids are getting, you know, get that. And sorry, the 30 minutes foundation in addition to the 80 Yes, yes. Because you, if you go back to this, it was 150 minutes of time that was we were doing for literacy. So that 30 minutes of foundations was cons pretty consistent across the schools, which is why I broke it out as that, that piece as well. And then I would also, um, so the rest of our programming is we have um, art um, one day a week for 45 minutes a day, PE twice for 45 minutes. Health is varied. Um, we have difficulty in finding health educators, um, certified teachers for health. Um, and then library, I did not include this yesterday for those of you who are, and thank you, um, Natasha, for, for calling me on that one. But the library is one day a week for 45 minutes as well. Um, with it for all our class. And when I say one day a week, that's each class in the school has it that many times in the week. So um, so each student will, will see art once a week, PE twice a week, um, and library once a week at, at the minimum. And, so. and then music is the next one. And uh, yes, it is uh, kind of, you can see some consistency and you can see some inconsistency there as well. Uh, music is, um, is definitely something that is dependent upon the number of students, um, what the students are interested in. And, um, and so, for example, uh, you can see that one of the schools is hoping to add band this year. So they didn't have enough students for band um, in the past. And so there's some difficulty with consistency. You also see that it varies grade levels. So in some places it's fifth and sixth. In some places it's fourth through sixth. Um, so this is an area where it, we, we could stand some more consistency. Um, and, and the the music teachers uh, did get together and articulate some uh, like when do kids move from general music to being a part of a more comprehensive band or strings program and all of that. Um, and so that's where some of this work comes from is making sure the kids get general music um, once a week for 45 minutes in the lower grade levels and then by fifth, sixth grade, they would be moving into some kind of instrument or chorus program as well. Chris. Oh. Are, are these columns representative of the schools? Like, is this they are? Palace, Dodi, um, no, I didn't. I didn't actually no. label them which school they were. Okay. Um, I didn't want to. Sorry, see. that was just the order they've been in. It, it's it's yeah. not in this okay. one, and okay. it was just to uh, just so that we didn't go after one school and why they were doing something specific. We don't want to pit school against school for okay. why one's doing one way and one's not doing another. That's not appropriate. Chris, you had a question. So, can you talk to students. the mics or yeah. so, so. <laughs> if, if there are not enough students to um, do band, um, is something done at that time that's dedicated to music, some type of music or education in one way or another? I would have to ask. Or is it so all students have general music for 45 minutes, and 
and then we had articulated in a sort of an inflection point yeah. or an inflection You got to use a mic. Around, sorry, yeah. 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 Yeah, for the people in line. So, sorry. All students um, K through six have a general music class for 45 minutes a week. That's an agreement and we can absolutely staff that and it's not contingent on interest, right? Kids go. And we had articulated agreements around when students would have opportunities for instrumental music experiences and chorus experiences. And we had said fifth and sixth grade is when that would begin. Also in alignment with just sort of where we were in terms of uh, all of the foundational literacy and math work that we were doing in the earlier grades. And we have not universally been able to offer instrumental in grades five and six for lots of reasons, including primarily student interest or a lack of interest. Um, and so we've responded in different ways. And that's what you're seeing on that chart. So for your school system, your school are they able to get banned? No, because they don't have, not if there aren't enough kids to have no, banned. If we had enough kids. If we had enough kids. Cool. Yes. yes. Yeah. And and we have been yes. So we've staffed our music accordingly for the expectation that there would be ensemble enough ample staffing for ensemble experiences in the upper grades. Yeah, that's factored into the staffing pattern. Yeah. Um question in the comments. So question when it is saying that band is two times a week for thirty minutes, of course. Where is that 30 minutes coming out of? I'm assuming you're not adding 30 minutes on today. We are not. So, <laughs> so I. I, I just have to apologize. Jen's been in the elementary schools more than I yeah. have at this point. So it it varies. Um, sometimes kids are pulled out of math class or literacy class. We're trying really hard not to do that. Occasionally, there was some stuff before school if kids were ar arriving before school. Sometimes it's been uh, during a, a recess block and the kids have agreed for a while that they want to, so then they rotate a schedule so they're not missing their same recess the whole time. It's really school by school, and um, you're right, we're not adding 30 minutes to the day right now for that experience. Jen, when you say too that that's also that five, six combination often is departmentalized for that type of rotation that makes sense with that group grade level as well. I would say that varies by school a bit yeah. too, depending on uh, whether or not a school has numbers and whether or not a school has decided to approach it as a departmentalized approach or not, and that's staffing and numbers related. Yeah. Um, thank you. And then the comment was um, for schools that are not doing band, my understanding, okay, I'll just speak for Jody. My understanding is that there are other musical programs that are being implemented that are allowing students to have additional musical uh, experiences that may not be specific to band. So I make that comment because I, I just don't want this to appear that if they're not getting this thing, it doesn't mean they're not having some right. other sort of experience mm -hmm. with music or with art or whatever. And when we talk about equity <clears throat> and thinking about what is right for which kids, schools are making decisions to provide other types of experiences for students so they aren't necessarily missing out on other, uh, other opportunities. So I just want to put that out there because okay. I just don't want the data to be like, this data, not getting it and it's, yeah, this data came from our principals, so this yeah. is how they reported it to me. Well, I'm just sharing. It's great. I, it, it fills in the gaps, <laughs> uh, which is good. Okay. So I'm curious, just to, to make the extension, we have a leading model for reconfiguration that, that envisions three elementary schools. When we look at these particular subject areas, what, what are our expectations about preservation or uh, expansion of these different areas? I think the first is preservation of programs, right? So that we have chorus band programs available to those kids. How we expand them will, I, I think, really speaks to the point of time, mm -hmm. right? So we have to talk about time the same way that we talk about money because um, they're, they're both things that we have to budget. And so, um, so if we say that we... That we want um, that that we want students to have that 150 minutes of literacy and the 90 minutes of math, 
then we also have to make sure that we budget the time if we want band and chorus to be a part of that. And we, when we, you just heard Jen say that we, we, will, we will decide to cut those shorter sometimes in favor of those programs. Right now, I think that it works for us when we have those programs. So when we have a band and when we have a chorus, we're seeing, we're seeing it work within this. And so our first goal would be to preserve programs. Um, that we have in some of our, and you know, you see it's not in every school, but having switch, those things. Switch to three schools makes more, we, we more would, done. so there is an assumption that we make that, that more kids means that we're going to have more interest in these things, right? And I think it's fair to say that that's an assumption um, because we haven't, we haven't polled every kid about which do you want to do. Kids just got back to school, so we can start looking at some of those. Yep. So, but, but when is the interest gauge? Is it gauge now or is it gauge last year as school was ending and planning purposes as to whether or not students would be interested in participating in band? Or I would I would have to I would have to <laughs> I would have to check with the principals to see about that. So. Sometimes having underprivileged students be with more privileged students, sometimes the culture kind of changes, right? And people get inspired to try something that they haven't tried before. And so being in band, you're learning how to read music, you're learning how to play an instrument in great detail, and like this that's a very um, it's a it's a skill that you sort of learn foundationally that would kind of Incline somebody to maybe pursue that through high school and to, and to then have that, you know, be part of their life later. And so I think that as we explore the constraints, looking at that, that angle of the opportunity as well, you know, and I think that goes far beyond band. I think that goes for kids that wouldn't think that they could do an AP, you know, AP classes. And then, you know, having more peers to become friends with and feel inspired to, to try that. So, yeah, so that, okay, Diane, need, just let's oh, one second. So we are, uh, we're coming close into the people that have been sitting here since five o'clock that might need a little break. There's just really like three more slides. If we could get through those three more slides, and then take like a short break, we can come back and debrief the data. Is that okay? Yeah. So that we can, uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe four. Um, uh, no, yeah, we'll get more. Uh, slides. Oh, slides. <laughs> okay. It's not just three. Okay. All right. So, um, so there was also some questions around elementary athletics. So we can see what's what uh, students are able to do. There's a lot of sharing of kids across schools to be able to, to create teams. Um, and Berlin, Calistody, and Rumney have a part-time athletic director, very, very part-time athletic director that helps coordinate some of these activities. East Montpelier has a program that's uh, run through the rec program in the town. And so, um, so those, are, those are different, just different models that we have out there just showing it. All right. Um, Pre-K and community connections, uh, we, we showed some information about uh, having three schools, having fewer sites to manage would be advantageous for us. We can't fully staff all uh, sites at all of our schools for community connections and some of our programs uh, at the elementary level for pre-K are small. And so, um, so sustainable numbers of students is really an important part of this. And this is an area I will admit I don't know a tremendous uh, bit about it. This is an area where I'm learning more as Act 76, although we do have somebody on our board that knows um, some about this. But Act 76 is, um, is part of a, an expansion of pre-K programs that is currently exploring how to establish full school day, full school year programming for four-year-olds. And so we would think that this would better position us to respond to the demands of Act 76. Now, 
its implications around what this means for pre-K three, we don't know yet because there's some funding issues that have to be worked out about this that we're, we're not, that just aren't there yet. The implementation is supposed to be in the 26-27 school year uh, for this. And so there's a lot of details to be worked out with this program that would, would direct us in what ways we would probably want to do the program. Um, but it could better position us if we have fewer schools to be able to provide some of these services. And, and I will say that this is subject to change. Like it's just, we're, we're all learning about this as we go. Was that pretty close? What was yeah, Diane knows too. Oh, that's right. There's two. She's got numbers. the end. Oh, that's right. I've got you both on the ends. Yes. That's right. We bookended. Yeah. I got you. Appreciate it. And and we're gonna we're gonna need a lot of expertise as we move through this. Um, we had our estimated student populations. Um, I was not able. We were checking to see did this include um, the private providers or just the schools. I think it's just the schools. Um, yeah. For 26 that we're looking at, but we'll we'll work on those numbers a little bit more. We're we're trying to pull those together. Um, and then, um, and then transportation was another big one um, that we looked at. There is specific route information uh, down there at the bottom that's a link so that you can see exactly how long each uh, bus route is, morning and afternoon. There's a lot of information in that. I tried to summarize it just so you knew the number of bus routes, the number of stops that are on those bus routes, the length and miles, and the length of time from the very shortest to the very longest. I do need to point out, Doty has 31 comma 34 because it's the morning bus and the afternoon bus and 34 45 miles 90 um, minutes and 84 minutes they those are very long times we're looking at how we can reduce those even still one of the ways that we have in the past because this has been uh, since 2017 I believe is our or, yeah, somewhere, somewhere around there when we consolidated to one bus in the morning and afternoon for Doty is the bus runs the route in the opposite direction so that the kid who has the longest ride in the morning has the shorter ride in the afternoon is the goal. There are some complications because of the joint pre-K K programs that are between mm -hmm. Rumney and Doty that we're trying to work out because the travel times have, um, they're, they're not where we would like them to be. Our goal is to have kids on a on a bus no more than um, uh, what was the average uh, two, hours. two hours a day, a day average. Um, so an hour morning, hour and afternoon, we can pretty much hit that mark except for right there. And so we're working on that. So two hours two hours average for this district. No more than two hours. It doesn't mean that no, all of the kids. Yeah, yeah. Two hours maximum. Yeah, oh, two hours yes. maximum. Okay. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Day. Yes. Day. So it's not like. No, no, no. Most, most kids are not, not on for that long. Yeah. Thank you. Not even close. <laughs> yeah. All right. But we are a very large district when it comes to distances. Stephen, just a clarification. So when it yep. says three in the morning, that's three different buses running simultaneously. Correct. Yep. Correct. And so, oh, and I would also point out for U32, one of those buses in the morning and the afternoon runs to Orange for our students who come in on tuition. So Orange, Washington, we have tuition students that we provide a bus for. And that is very cost effective given the amount of tuition that they pay. So, so that's a, just just so you know. So was the Doty running like a whole road from pre-merger time or was it implemented after merger? Yeah, Doty has had the one route, and Michelle should have this. So Doty's had the one route. Um, they did they it for decided. budgetary purposes when they were the Worcester School Board. Um, back when they were the Worcester School Board, it was um, the principal and their board decided at that time to eliminate one one bus. So the bus it impacts the high school slightly because they have to do um, meet at Doty. Two high school buses meet at Doty. The kids get off of the bus and they go on to uh, the other one, and then the bus starts the route from from what, from Doty to Charter. So this this one bus in the that was before, the before. So we before. could change that as a district since our merger and had two buses and eliminated or significantly decreased the Doty time because that's the and that's the factor that reduces all the other buses. All those other bus routes have stayed, this, that's what their schools had budgeted I, way back when. Right. But I'm just saying, it's like we did not. It's like it's like it's like it's like it's 
So, so yeah. there have been some changes to bus routes. And I would also say that in our last budget, mm -hmm. we eliminated four of the bus routes that we had. So that changed it as well um, for what we could do. Um, I have the bus company working on what would it look like for three elementary schools. I, as I said, they were supposed to have it to me yesterday. We're still working on it. Um, they, they're a little busy right now at the beginning of the year as well, but we're, we're going to get that information. Um, Go ahead. Just to follow up along, so when we merged, there was no conversation about adding another route to no. So no. Not that I'm aware of. No. Transportation Not is that the I'm first aware. thing that people want to cut. So that's the other thing. The conversations last year and the last couple of years is like, how do we make transportation much efficiency mm -hmm. and cut it? So it was not a decision that was made for trying to not be building more. It, it just it just feels like if we're talking equity, yeah, and yeah there are yeah, other totally. schools that have multiple bus routes, mm -hmm. and we have one, and we've got kids on the bus for ninety minutes. Like that's not equitable. So I'm just kind of curious why that. Was never. I mean, that doesn't need to be answered now. But that's yeah, frustrating I, for me. I don't have the answer. And I then, and then I guess so. My follow up to that would then be if we maintain more than three elementary schools, mm -hmm. can we also have the transportation department look at adding another route to some of these to, to Doty specifically, since it only has one, and what the you know shifting some of that around so it's we're not maintaining a ninety minute. I will say that we're looking into it right now. This is, for me, this is one of those aha moments because mm -hmm. I have not, in my past role, I was not paying attention to the Doty bus. Um, and so this is one of those where, what what are the options for us and what can we do um, in the future and what would it look like under different circumstances? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so I, I would just say that, yes, I'm. we're, we're gonna try to figure it out. That's why I appreciate okay. you bringing it forward. It's I, I mean, think we're all just a little shocked that those of us who have been on the board for years have never, we've never seen well, this. It's kind of our responsibility. No, I know. I know. Exactly. And, and I would just exactly. say, like, this, one of the things that... Wait, wait, wait. But it's not our responsibility to say how many buses. It's our responsibility to say that the kids need to be transported and that we have that two hour. But I, I totally agree with what you guys are saying about the equity. That was something that we could have looked at it instead of just cutting on transportation. So I'm not denying, but it's not our job to, I just don't want to get us in the weeds to say how many. No, but if we're I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can I just say I've been Michaela. holding, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I've just Finland. been holding like comments on a lot of other slides because I was told we're Yeah, 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 we're going to try it. Yeah, 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 I agree. So I, I, would, I would say this, and I think, it, I think it's a fair statement to say that some of this information that, we're, that I'm looking at is the first time that I'm seeing it as well, and I think it's important for us. Um, you know, I was asked by a board member when I started, am, am I going to show everything good, bad, and ugly? Uh, that, that's some of the ugly right there, and so I want to just make sure that we, we are just being fair to the data. That's what it is, and we'll try to figure out how to work with it. Um, so middle school program, not that I'm trying to rush this, but um, we've talked about middle school program, um, but not enough in some of our work. Um, I think that la last night Becca was able to join us um, as the new principal at U32, and she made a really good point, is that U32 is already set up with the programs, infrastructure, and building um, to accommodate a grade six. So we already have a core structure uh, for our middle school. We, um, we already have the facilities for, uh, for that grade level. So just in terms of the physical plant and the ability to, to integrate it within the structures, the structures already exist for a middle school. So moving the sixth grade here as part of the middle school program is, could, could be fairly seamless, but certainly would be a big transition for a lot of kids at once. Um, and so it does allow specialization for teachers. Currently in our district, we have um, no more than a, three, maybe, middle grade endorsed teachers in the grades five through nine, which are teachers that just specialize a little bit more. Most of our teachers at the 712 system right now are, are certified 712. Um, and so uh, this gives us a really good opportunity to have a group of teachers who are specialized in the middle grades endorsement. Um, we have a teacher group that is looking at how to get this endorsement. So they've been working towards what needs to be done. It can be done in the time period um, that we're looking at because most of that work would be done in June at the Middle Grades Institute uh, for our teachers to be able to get that. And so that is um, something that we would make available to all of our teachers in the district um, for them to be able to see what would they need to do to get that endorsement. Um, so they were all um, eligible for that. 
it would be something that n I would assume that not every teacher would be able to get that endorsement quickly. And so there might be a need for some provisional licensure, um, depending on our configuration and, and what teachers we have. And so, so there is some there is some work to be done around that, but it certainly allows for specialization that does not happen at the elementary level, um, and uh, and we don't really have a whole lot of here at U thirty two at this point either. Um, it is greater access to co curricular activities. There's just there are more things when there are more kids, um, and so U thirty two has that capability for at the, not just athletics but theater. Um, we have after the bell program, which is a middle school after school program um, that could be expanded um, to, to be able to, to support our sixth graders as well. Um, that also dovetails with some of the other activities of sports, theater. Um, we have a full band program, uh, chorus program, and all those kinds of things. And, and I would just say that our band program has really started to see a resurgence in the last few years since COVID. And we're starting to see more kids engaged in that. And so that's just, Starting them at the sixth grade is just an earlier grade to get started at. It also is there for their world languages um, and, and some of those pieces as well. It's, and it's more specialized academics, right? So there is a, there's not only a literacy and math block, but there is a science block and a global citizenship block as well. But we also would be looking at a more comprehensive middle school program that would integrate those subjects uh, together within those cores. And so, um, it would be an efficient use of our space. We have a lot of space here, and we're going to have, in the next two years, about 90 fewer students at U32, just in terms of the enrollment. So the big drops in enrollment are happening uh, here in the next two years. Stephen, I have a question. Yeah. What would you say um, regarding? So we, sorry. Oh yeah. We, we're okay. We're going to just keep just sorry, like your right. question. I'm almost there. And then we'll come back. Okay. All right. So um, so. There's been some questions about equitable access. We've talked about it in other areas here. This is more specific to um, some of the middle school pieces as opposed to just the whole district. Um, and so this is just the access to co-curricular activities. We have late bus transportation. They don't go to the doorstep of each person, but they do get the kids back into the community. I think that's important to note. Um, and then teachers would be endorsed in middle grades education, which would focus more on those grade level groups. And they're also, and this is, goes kind of along with what Julia had talked about as well, the intervention flexibility is greater when you have more kids. So you can do the small group, you can focus on um, multiple programs. So sometimes uh, kids don't respond to one type of intervention. It's difficult to have two types of intervention from one person sometimes. And so, um, and these are kids who don't necessarily qualify for uh, special education services, but just need a little extra help. And so we can have uh, more programs available for those kids to be able to uh, to get that help. Um, and so those are some of the things that, that you can do with just a larger class of kids. All right, so the final slide is this is all of those options that we have heard from or have been proposed or have uh, there's some iteration of all those processes. I'm going to leave this slide pretty quickly to show you that we have a table that we're creating and it is not fully filled in. Um, and so this is um, putting those configuration models that were on that slide and putting some of the broad criteria categories um, here for us to say. And so I just, I filled in a few that were pretty straightforward, um, like facilities for one elementary pre-K five, we can't meet that at this moment in time. Um, that's not something that we have the facility for immediately. So um, when I say can't meet, it doesn't mean that we couldn't meet, it just we can't meet it right at this moment in time. And um, one of the other down here, um, if I can get to it, is the, um, I put on the community schools has been something that's been proposed. But I also just want to point out that some of the, that some of that is not uh, funded right now. So, but it's, a, a, I would say that with community schools, and we have to have a bigger discussion, obviously, about this, that is a model that could be applied to any of the other configuration models as well, right? So it's not, I, I do not see it as something that is only one of our configurations, but it can be applied to any of our configurations. And I would also point out, um, I threw in the Montpelier U32 high school merger. There's a facility problem um, that we would have with that um, if we brought it here because we don't have a space for our middle schoolers necessarily um, at the moment. It also requires the merger of districts. 
and collective bargaining agreements have, would have to be rewritten and merged for us to do that kind of program. Um, that's a big deal. Um, and so I know that it's been thrown out there mm -hmm. as a possible solution, but um, I would say that that is a very uh, complex and long-term conversation and decision that would have to be made, not just by our communities, but by Montpelier and Roxbury as well. So that's really complicated. Um, and so this is just an attempt to get us started so that we can at least put on here that we have um, other options that have been thrown about, and then we'll try to get in some information in here about uh, um, each of the criteria and what we can and can't meet around this. Um, I would also, I, and I, I'm sorry, one last piece, is one of our um, uh, configuration options that we had talked about for a while was the two elementary early learning center at Berlin, U32, sixth through 12th grade. And that's there on the chart. In the first column, it can't meet our criteria for transportation. It, transportation becomes almost impossible in terms of what we've just articulated, and we just had some of that conversation. And so we, we really eliminated that one, and it's why you haven't seen it come back much, is we looked at that transportation piece, and Berlin sits far enough away from the outer reaches of the other side of our district that makes this really difficult for our youngest kids yeah. to be able to be on a bus. And so that's why that one was eliminated and why you haven't seen that as part of the of the ongoing conversations. And so just want to show you, we're trying to trying to, to get sure. some information up there. We're gonna take a eight minute break sure. and come back. Thank you everybody. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. I, I just want to thank everyone. This is a lot of information and I think that one of the things that I realized um, as I was looking at this data is we need a mechanism to share this more consistently and I think that um, Ed Quality also will be looking at some data but not all of this and so um, I just think that um, what I'm going to be trying to do is build this into the Colt report as part of just a routine of information for us so that we're not having to digest this much information all at once but over over the next you know months and hopefully years of time, we'll be able to um, to have this information come up regularly enough to where we can review it and see what's going on. And so I just really appreciate your patience with us pulling together this much information. And I hope that you can see how helpful the configuration conversation is in providing more information um, in this setting. So thank you. Um, and I think there were some questions. Yeah, so we're, we're going to move it. We're going to we're gonna move into yes. questions, so Daniel. I appreciate that. And I, yeah, I think just to echo what you said, I think a lot of us were tempted to dive deeper on a lot of these subjects. And it's like, it takes a lot of discipline to stay <laughs> with the germane conversations about right. configuration. And I'm, I'm struggling to do so, but I'll do my best. But um, I had three areas I was interested in. One, smallest, small, I'll start with the smallest. One was related to the rec program at EMES yep. and how, how we handle equitable opportunity and sort of fair budgeting across recreation if, if Callis joins East Montpelier. Mm -hmm. And I guess presumably historically, East Montpelier was not satisfied with the level of recreation that the district was providing, so they did their own thing. Or no, I don't no, know. What, I don't no, know the no, history. It's been, it, it, I'm they, curious why what the history is, and then I'm curious sort of what the what, what the strategy would be. I haven't even considered. Okay, that yet, but yeah, very, but it's a good question. Yeah, and I, and I can tell you that it, it, it has been like that forever. So uh, Mrs. Seilinga's husband runs the recreation now. He was not the one that ran it before, but it was in it, just like you were, that we were talking about so how the community meets the needs of yeah. the school. So it had been met by the community. What we decided is that to have equity around the schools, I think it was 2000, I, it was pre consolidation I want to say it was 2019 that we decided to hire an athletic Director, not direct, an athletic. What we we call it? What is it called? Um, yes. Coordinator. 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 Yeah. yeah, and it's, it's a very part-time person doing. Yeah, that. so yeah. all of the schools contribute to that coordinator, and that coordinates the, the sports in all the schools except East Montpelier that is still funded by the community. So it's not taken away, you know. And it was just like that. That's the way that it's been. 
for, for, for years. So if we were to change, you know, then that would all come. Okay. East Montpelier is not the only town that had yeah. um, uh, a separate a separate one. Callis used to have one as well. We used to Callis had its own rec department that did that type of stuff, and then when the volunteers dropped off, that's when it what filled back on the schools. Okay. Yeah, it'd just be interesting to explore a new model that might provide more robust recreation across the schools and. Yeah. It strikes me that we could do that irrespective of whether we reconfigure yeah. or not, but if we do reconfigure, there's a, it seems like there's an obvious opportunity there. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just stick with that one because I'm sure other people have opinions. <laughs> Diane? I had a, a well, it's a, so it's a wondering based on the conversation that we had about art and, and music and uh, those details and the fact that it, there's always that competition, that tension in the schedule. So I guess I'm wondering, because we've, we've said that one of the outcomes we're looking for is an expansion of opportunities. And so if we're not talking about expanding those opportunities and the schedule is that tension, then um, what opportunities are we talking about? When are we talking about those happening? So. That, that question popped up as we were looking at that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just, a, I think we need, again, we keep hearing um, from communities too, please share with us what those expanded opportunities are. And um, <clears throat> I'm still not hearing them. And actually not hearing them, especially in the place where I thought they were going to be. Are you asking for them now? I'm kind not of wandering sure. around that question, I think. Right, yeah. So I'm not sure if it's possible to do that now, or I'm yeah. asking for us to be sure to have it, and perhaps it is part of that budget. But I think the statement needs to be made. We, we need the clarity and the specific, I can never say that word, more specifics around that. So. Okay. Daniel, hey, wait. Daniel can go ahead because you. No, no. Yeah, <laughs> Daniel, go ahead. Daniel, yeah, everybody's afraid to step up. <laughs> um, well, just to just to piggyback on that, I have been having the same thought, and to me, like the most compelling space for expanded opportunity is longer school hours, and I could see even things like art, music, and offerings like that. Uh, I'm not suggesting that teachers stay longer. I'm suggesting that the buildings stay open longer. And we offer programming, and I'm curious about budget implications for that. And like, what was what's the baseline expense, staff expense for staying open till five and opening at seven thirty? And is that community connections or is that something else? Mm -hmm. Great question. Great. Yeah. So as we are currently looking at this, we have forty five minutes a week for our, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's. What, six and a half hours, I think, we have budgeted for time? Yeah, I think that's what those numbers yeah, yeah, add up yeah. to 390 minutes or something like that. A little transition time. Okay, yeah. Like so um, there's no room for additional time in art right now, is there? Not without taking away from something, from something else. else. Okay. Right. Um, or or I, I would say, or integrating it into the programming that is already there. Is it? You know whether or not that happens already. Uh, it seems to, like to, some ex to some extent, in some areas, the art teachers will work with the classroom teachers to, to do projects that are associated with what they're doing in class. Um, so those do occur. Um, they're not as deliberate as they could be, but they do occur. So are we looking in terms of any reconfiguration, whether it's four schools or three schools, elementary schools, where it will free up more time so that art and music um, or art like things can actually be expanded from what we have now. Is that even a realistic? We, we have not had any discussion about adding time to our schedule. Okay, we would ha in order to have that expansion, we'd have to add time. If if we were going to stick with what we considered a baseline of right. of activities, there would probably I, I think what Daniel was suggesting is probably what we would explore first. And would that be volunteer staff? Or I, I I would doubt that. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, other question is, um, can you, could you find out from the 
uh, transportation company, what a second bus route for Doty would cost, um, and how long it would take to implement that. It, that may not be the solution to it, but we're going to look at like that's one possibility. Oh, I mean, for this year, <laughs> that's what I, I understand. Yeah. That, um, yeah. to go to this. But it may not be adding a route. We'll, we'll, okay. We're looking at options okay. for that. Thank you, Thank you very much. I had uh, three um, considered or pr proposed uh, options that weren't on your table um, that I, I that were in forms that I went to in my notes. Um, That's great. So if you'd like those, like building, yeah. building elementary school is one. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of in there. there. It's on there. Yeah, it's in it's there. On there? Okay. Yeah. Um, rent, rent the space in the summer for revenue. Um, and it's not really a consolidation thing, but it's, right. it's another it's another thing that would that would, that would uh, occupy the space. Um, K through eight schools and a high school. That was yeah, that was in there. K eight's in there. Not not possible with the current size of our elementary schools, and we would completely underutilize this space at that point in time. Great. Yeah. 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 That one was in the chart. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um. The chart on the on this is a quite as comprehensive as the one that's in the. Okay. And I did make that available. I, I saw that that was that link was uh, restricted, but it's been fixed, so people can see it. Um, yeah, I have two two pieces. Um, the first one is when I think of the wording of expansion, I think it can be two things: um, expansion for the children who are currently not getting banned, right? Meaning equitable access to it, and then expansion adding to. Um, and I think it's really important that we consider the the optics of that right to your point you're saying you know where is the expansion what are the expanded opportunities and i think it really comes down to from what we've seen the expanded opportunities are that children who currently cannot participate in band because of the small population would be able to because of an increase in population and i think i think that's important and i also think to to your point if we want to truly expand and add, we're going to have to shift the structure of the day, which is a whole nother conversation. So I just wanted to say that because that's how I'm understanding it. But I do think for our constituents and our community, it's really important we differentiate that. Um, the other question I have, and part of this is because I wasn't on the board before, so help me, help me learn, make me smarter. Um, we're talking about middle school coming to U32 and we're talking about reconfiguration and i'm curious as to why they have to go together and maybe they don't and, and maybe i'm making an assumption but the reason i say that is because they're two really significant changes um, and i'm wondering if we're considering thinking about how we might break it up and maybe it's in the transition part of it or it's you know we're going to focus on this piece and then we're going to do that or there's a benefit to doing them together so a big question. I can give a partial answer yeah. to that is that, um, for, and I think it's been pointed out around how many classrooms do we have at Romney oh. available for us. So having the sixth grade still there mm -hmm. would make it probably overly mm -hmm. difficult to do any kind of reconfiguration. Um, the same for East Montpelier actually runs into some of the same problem. Thank you. So it's it's more of a facility. That's why they're, they've been kind of joined together. Yes. But I would also say that should we choose not to reconfigure our elementary schools, the conversation about creating more comprehensive middle school by bringing the sixth grade here is a, it is a separate but linked discussion Correct. in all of this. Yeah. yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I knew there was a connection, I just wasn't putting and, we, and to add to that, we've been talking about, we talk about moving the sixth graders at our previous budget yeah. uh, meetings too, so we've been talking about it. Okay, thank yeah. you. Ursula. I wanted to talk a little bit about or expand on the idea of our expanded offerings and not just for band or art, but we heard both um, Julia Pritchard and Jen talk about our special education and just even interventions in our multi layer systems of support. The expansion of flexibility and how we deliver that to our students so that they get the best experience not one that's based on how many kids are in the school but one that's based on what their actual needs are thank you one other thing that i'm just remembering from our last budgeting process is although we didn't shrink art time for students 
You heard a lot from our art teachers because we cut their FTE and they talked a lot about not having to transition and not being able to actually offer the same art programs that they had offered in the past. And that's just coming to my mind of a way where we still see the minutes, but maybe not the same offerings according to what the art teachers were saying. Yes. Um, uh, two quick just plugs for things that have already been said. Um, you know, I remember hearing a lot from the community about, for example, foreign language, and so I just want to be realistic about whether that's going to be something that is possible. Um, and also to reiterate, um, I think I heard Stephen say that this will be the next meeting, but really seeing like literally a floor plan of the schools and how the classrooms are going to look, because I'm a little worried about capacity in these buildings. Um, and then my other question is about the middle school. Um, you know, Stephen, you talked about like, you know, working with the current middle school teachers about getting middle level certification. Has there been, is it feasible and have you been working with the current at sixth grade teachers to get middle level certified also? So this has been very teacher driven at this point in time. So they've reached out the, through the, the union about what's available. There's a very, there's a distinct difference between if you're a K-6 certified teacher and a 712 certified teacher is what you need to do to become middle grade certified. It is more difficult for our K-6 teachers. Um, the requirements are more difficult than those that are 712. Um, but the, the information has been shared. And it would be feasible? Yeah, absolutely. In the time frame, or there could be a waiver it, or something? It may not be as feasible for the K-6 certified to be quickly, but we do want to make room for any teacher who wants to get middle grade certified to, to join that program. Thank you. So, yeah. Any other? Oh, I'm sorry. Amelia, yeah. Um, um, so... A lot of community members have been concerned about sixth graders coming into middle school. And I'm wondering about speaking to those concerns um, for emotional well-being and what we might do to mitigate any challenges, um, what services we could provide to kind of manage that if that were to, ha that were to happen. So I know um, we did speak a little bit more in depth um, yesterday okay. on that um, but uh, the program there's two pieces there's the physical of how do we keep kids separate from you know middle mm -hmm. schoolers separate from high schoolers and so there's there's some both physical ways that we can do that but they do share some spaces yep. um, in transition um, for them but we also could create a more self-contained program so right now we have shared staff between the middle school and the high school a more um, a little bit larger number of kids, not a whole lot larger, but certainly uh, more grade level kids could do a self-contained program so that those teachers were more focused on those kids. Mm -hmm. um, from, and the core structure that we have is built around that very transition. Because the biggest transition we have in our district is from <laughs> sixth to seventh grade right now. Mm -hmm. um, and our cores are, acu are acutely aware of that. We would have to transition two groups of kids. And mm -hmm. uh, Becca was talking about that um, yesterday in that that would be the big plan. Like, mm -hmm. how do we transition two groups of kids here with the needs of, of both of them into those cores? Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, the cores are really well suited to do that. And we've yeah. got some things that are in place, and we would have to expand a few things to include more kids. Mm -hmm. and, so, mm -hmm. um, and I would say we've, we've allocated services uh, at the middle school level. We have school counselors. You know, those people are in place already. Yeah. And so welcoming another grade level. And over the course of the next two years, the number of kids in the middle school wouldn't be a drastic increase overall. Right. You know. Okay. And can, then, can, can you oh. share a little bit more? Just a little bit more about what Becca talked about. We already have three cores. Yeah. So coming in, it would be the sixth, seventh, and eighth. So, and I don't want to hold yeah. her to a, yeah, no, a complete a, configuration, but, but yeah. So there are three cores right now, and um, and there are several different ways that you can uh, you can look at that. So if you have a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade core. <clears throat> Those teachers could loop with kids for uh, multiple years, so that uh, and that provides one type of support. The teachers could specialize in each one of those years, and and so our TA system, which already exists, would just incorporate those kids. I think there might be some questions about TA. That's a long period of time. Some schools split it up between a middle school TA and a high school TA. I don't see that happening at U32, but it certainly would be something that I think they could explore. 
Um, but I think that overall, some of the things that are in place already can be expanded to support sixth graders coming as well. Mm -hmm. And we could see in Jen's presentation, I think in the curriculum, looking at the benefits of stability and also flexibility to manage the dynamics of how mm -hmm. kids learn and and yeah, I, and I think that that's together. one place where we can say the increased opportunity would be, you know, languages could be offered at the sixth grade level um, because those are already offered. You know, we've got the teaching force for that. Um, art and PE and health, we have, the, you know, those programs are here as well. So. Okay. And I just wanted to piggyback on Diane's comment about sort of like when could we expect to sort of reap the benefits if we were to go forward with um the reconfiguration of you know like sorry <laughs> i'm not speaking clearly <laughs> um when when we i don't know if we can predict that but it wouldn't be immediate right and so sort of having that discussion of uh, you, which benefits which the benefits, benefits of expanding programs and so right, kids, kids engagement sort of, in those programs well i'm talking about sort of budget wise Okay. Right. Okay. So we're going to be faced with a budget and we're going to need to kind of maintain what we have. And if we move, oh, sorry, students in, if we move sixth grade in, we still sort of have this budget that we're working with. And we've heard from the community that there's not a, a ton of cost savings by closing, but when we factor in the depreciating cost of the buildings that we won't be paying for, could we sort of calculate a five year savings plan that's that in the budget that's going to be going to services directly to benefit the students so we are going to do our best to present okay. those budgets uh, in the next meeting and okay. so that's what we're, we're working on right now is um, what does uh, our current configuration what would it cost for us just to baseline so keep everything as is and then what would it look like um, if we had the three school model first now I know there's been requests for others but we've got those two are are we're, we're pretty close on so we're going to see what else we can do to give you some more information it's okay. just simply a manpower issue right now and right. so we're trying yeah. to bring that together okay. Thank you. Um, two quick comments and one not quick comment one about the community schools um, I know that that grant program is no longer funding this program but there are other funding sources that yeah. are available so I just want to put that out there that just because that yeah, I, I wasn't gone, trying to, there's no <laughs> that was the big one so I just wanted to make yeah. sure yeah. Um, but there are other funding sources available and with community schools depending on how you implement it there's funding sources coming into the district that will help pay for things Understood. that won't be coming out of the school budget um, so I do think it's something that we should be thinking about anyway um, second to piggyback off of Daniel um, in terms of expanding time outside of the teacher day. <laughs> um, I'm glad you clarified that. Um, Northfield does a program called Bridges, which was amazing. Um, and my kids participated in it, but it allowed for like coding classes. Like if they, they had like nine different programs offered five days a week and kids could decide which of those programs they wanted to be in. And it ran in like eight week blocks mm -hmm. so they could keep changing. Um, but it was a really great way to provide opportunities for students that were above and beyond what okay. um, the school did. And that's a program that's been running for a while. And it's, I think it goes through the middle school. So um, I'll look at it. Yeah. And then um, the comment that's going to be a little bit longer is around science <laughs> and global <laughs> citizenship. Um, I said this in the, the um, Ed Quality meeting but it, it's really um, disturbing to me <laughs> that there is only 25 minutes a day that's allocated for global studies and or science and that means that one or the other is being taught or not taught um, knowing that our fifth graders are going to be tested on science and they're only getting 25 minutes maybe every other day um, is concerning to me that they would be prepared to be able to do the testing i taught steam k through five <laughs> so i'm very aware of what the next generation science standards are and what the expectations are for students with science also because that was my role i had the time and the ability to really work with classroom teachers to help integrate the science program into their literacy and their math um, beyond what they were doing in the lab with me 
And I think that the staff that we have are more than capable to do that work. I have all faith in the staff that we have throughout the district, but I also understand the amount of time it takes. <laughs> um, and so I, I, my concern is when we keep saying our educators are just going to integrate this into what they're already doing, if they don't have the time, if they don't have not just individual time, but team planning time or time to work with the special areas teachers um, or the ability to do additional professional development to really make sure that they are able to implement and integrate those things that whatever their best of intentions are, they are not necessarily going to be able to provide our students the instruction that they want to provide our students or that our students should be getting in regards to either of those subject areas. So I just, I'm... No. I, I would say apart from reconfiguration, you know, the second goal of our strategic plan is really around our curriculum and instruction and, in, and improving that. And that's what we've got to do, regardless of what we do yeah. around configuration, is making sure that we have the supports and, and, the, and really the resources to help our teachers do that work. And so I think the only way we're going to meet that goal is doing what you just described, is making sure that those supports are there. Okay. I think that was it. Okay. For now. Thank you. Okay. I, I don't want to keep us here until 10 at night and then Brian Miller will be fine. Hoping to still finish at 9. Okay. A couple of things that came up yesterday at the configuration committee, and we didn't have time to put it in it to the presentation, too. I just want to make sure that we're bringing all of the comments that were made yesterday, was which is a little bit of what you were talking, Natasha, but mostly before and after care. Yeah. Mm, the, the before and after care is the one thing that, you know, what is where is the best baseline and the minimum? And then how they do it, if it's that particular program and what it is, it just does have a baseline of before and after and after care. Uh, and then the other thing that came on the, what they were asking was the nursing time allocation. We would update that. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, the conversation that came up with the partly athletic director. That was confusing. We can, we can have more information about that. And then at our next meeting uh, for the configuration committee, we will be looking at the metrics that is being developed right now as we go and finalize the models for study so that we can make an informed decision that is coming, right? So just wanted to put that out there. Uh, and then I would like to move into our next item in the in the budget in uh, in the budget. In the agenda, and then we'll have time to talk about this at our next board meeting, too. Okay. And so I need to go back to the agenda, have some things open. So now it's approved the new teachers. Page five, if I could have a motion. Motion to hire Elaine Riley, a point to Callis for library media specialist in technology. So yeah, you can, yeah. Just, we do it slowly. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I move to Christina Snook, point three Doty for library media specialist and tech integrationist. Mark Chamberlain, point two Doty for PE. Rick Agron, one point oh Berlin for a five six class teacher. Point. To say that ben, those were changing FTEs, and now are, you're moving into. Okay, those were changing FTEs, now we're doing long term substitute. Ben Laro to cover an interventionist who will return in October. And then a change in position is Jesse Dahl. So it's going to be 0.8 Berlin, 0.2 Rumney for library media specialist and tech integrationist. Second? Oh, second. second. Thank you, Zach. I have a quick question, question about the change in FTEs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like Mark Chamberlain, he's still at Berlin, correct? He just correct. He, we just increased from 0.8 to 1.0. And that's at Doty, though. Yes. Correct. Yep. So he's 0 0.8 at Berlin, Berlin. and 0 0.2 at Doty. Yes. yes. Got it. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Being none, the motion carries. Yeah, now we have our I do have another, I'm consent. sorry, this, this is not a question, but the forms were not consistent. Like there was at least one form that didn't have the salary. And we have so it, we have it. 
Okay. Do you want it? Yeah, we didn't have it at the moment. We're okay. All right. Yeah. But if you need that, I have that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then let's move into the consent agenda. I have a motion to approve the minutes. A um, uh, second. Um, I had some comments on the on the slides last last time we met, and I don't see those in the minutes. So is that typical? We're not. We're not. Uh, do you, so hold on a minute. One second. A motion to approve the minute. You will have something. I second. I second. Chris moved it. I second. And Galen second. Okay. Your okay. Sorry, I jumped the shark. Um, the. Um, review data line. I had some comments on the on the slide about variance of population. You can tell Lisa and she will Sorry. make the amendment. Okay. Yeah, and, um, I think that was all it was. Is that I was I pointed out that there was all, there was a lot of variance in the class sizes from year to year, and part of that was um, ca causing the perceived enrollment to go down. Thank you. Okay. Everybody in favor of giving the minutes as amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. And, and then, uh, as the future agenda items, uh, and then we're going to move into uh, the Alan uh, question. The future agenda items for next, uh, it's our next board meeting. And at our next board meeting, we'll look at our, our work plan. So we have a full board meeting on September 18. Budget. Uh, and, and it's budget. Yeah, and budget learning. <laughs> so we are not changing anything, anything there. And before that, then the 16th, the configuration committee has a meeting uh, before the 18th. That's it. Now the question was brought up. Uh, by our new board member and the question on if we should reaffirm uh, the, the articles of, of agreement. That was the question that was brought up for, for discussion. Uh, the, the board has no legal authority to override the articles of agreement. That's, that's clear. We are bound by our articles of agreement as, as the board. Uh, and, and I know that this came up because of the testimony that I was read and because of the I, I was at the Dodi meeting and I said, you know, we, and that's basically what I was saying. We're bound by, there's no motivation by any of us. We would have to bring that to, to vote. So the testimony that, you know, was envisioning the possibility when we testify of empowering the legislature, right? But we, the only people that have that power is the legislator, not, not us. So it, it, it's a tough, you know, it's not in our purview to do that. And, to do what? Change the articles of agreement. We can't change the articles of agreement. We're bound by them, so I, there's I, no, no It's reason. not just about the, 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 the way the, the voters, there can be a petition um, to amend the articles of agreement, uh, and then the uh, district as a whole gets to vote on that, is yes. the way the articles read. And so it wouldn't be legislative. No, what I was saying is that the, the, the question came because of the testimony that well, I gave the as the VSBA board. So what I'm saying, that is completely different. Affirming the Articles of Agreement uh, tonight or whenever we want to do it, we, we don't have to do it. We, we are bound by those Articles of Agreement. The, our voters are the only ones that can change those Articles of Agreement. What I, I'm sorry. What I keep hearing, though, Floor, is not necessarily to affirm our articles of agreement, but to um, to uh, I don't know what if we, to basically say we're not in agreement with that um, whatever's going forward to the legislature that there's, we as a board make a stand against that is my there, that there's, those that, are two separate things okay. and that's that is, what I'm trying to separate those are okay. two separate things the email that you receive that's the steering committee is going to look at that yeah. this this is just about the articles of agreement we have been asked by a member of the public to reaffirm our articles of agreement as a board we do not need to reaffirm our articles of agreement because we are bound by our articles of agreement. As a board, we can we can say, and I think we can say tonight, nobody in this board has said that we want to change our articles of agreement. We're bound by our articles of agreement. Is that correct? Well, I, th I think there's a broader question really being raised that, um, and, and the concern is, is actually 
squarely raised by the, the recent letter that we got from uh, um, Andrew, um, because in that letter she's saying that she would like the board to um, make a motion to put forward to the community um, a, a proposed amendment to um, modify modify the artists of agreement so that um, the individual town where the school is located does not have um, the authority to vote not to close the school, which would bind the entire district. And so she's she's proposing, and this I think is is kind of a current underneath the uh, you know underneath the, the radar here of the potential for a proposal coming from this board that we would move to amend the Articles of Agreement if any one of our towns voted not to close the school. Um, so it's a subtle threat, um, um, I think. And that that is what I think Alan Gilbert is driving at, of saying that the board uh, will pledge not to uh, propose any amendment to the Articles of Agreement uh, if a town decides not to close a school to, op to essentially then have another vote for the district as a whole to amend the article so that the district as a whole could then vote to close the school against the will of a particular town. That's where I think the driving force is behind Alan's request. Not not to affirm, you're right, the district right the way it reads now is the individual towns are the ones who decide uh, whether or not they close their school, not the district as a whole. And I think he's looking for something more and saying the board will not um, propose that we amend that if a school decides if the town decides not to close it. That's accurate. I think that's what's driving now. Um, so I understand that, but if if well, if we receive as a board, if we receive a petition signed by a certain percentage of our voters to do that, then we have by like we have to bring that forward by law. Um, I actually don't think that's correct um, because I think there was a petition in South Burlington that wanted to retain the um, name of their mascot that was proposed. And I think that uh, the board decided not to submit, not to put that out to a vote. Uh, went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that the board has the authority whether or not to present the petition or not. So, so um, case so, closed, right? Well, like I you're agree. not bringing the petition, you're, you're not, we, I think you're bound by the Articles of Agreement right now. We Lord, will it's get a different across discussion. that bridge. That's a different discussion. We're talking about mm -hmm. after a school has, after a town has devoted not to close the school, if there's a petition to say to override that authority, um, that's what I think Alan's driving at. And so that's a different discussion. Because, you know, I, I would say that if we ended up going that way, uh, I think it would be a um, district nightmare because oh, yeah. there are lots of compromises that were made, including that, you know, taking on debt that three towns had that two towns did not have. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, servicing that debt. So there's lots of things that were compromised, and one of them was to give the individual towns the authority to maintain their school uh, if they decided. And that's a district responsibility. Clearly, a district responsibility that an individual town can decide on. So, so that's it's it's a it's a thicket, um, but that's what I think Alan is getting at. Not that we affirm what we already know we can't do, but that we won't. Try to do it later. Yeah. I was going to say, I think that there's a lot of layers of protection before that would ever happen. Right. We as a board would have to bring this up as a topic of discussion and say that we were going to propose a amendment to our articles of agreement. We would have to discuss it as a board of 15 people. We would have to then vote on it. It would have to pass the board and then be put to the voters. Right. And so again affirming a thing that we can't we don't decide our voters decide it almost smacks of like saying that we do have some control over it like we're going to affirm this but someday we could decide not to and that's not within our control like we i i don't know how you want to say this right like you want to do you want a motion where we go we're never going to change our articles of agreement because i think that that binds the board forever which would not be Feasible. Well, you're right. The, the board vote cannot bind a future board. Any comp 
you know, configuration or the same board. Same board can decide multiple different things. But I think the um, Worcester community is looking for an assurance that the board has no intention now to, um, you know, entertain or submit a petition to the district as a whole um, to modify the school closure portions of the articles agreement so that school closure is dependent upon a district wide vote as opposed to the town where the, where the school is located vote. And, and I think so you know, I, there'd be plenty of people who would want to close the school just to save money. Yeah. Um, so I, I repeat, I repeat Chris, nightmare. like we are bound by our articles of agreement. We worked really hard to come up with those articles of agreement. We would be losing the faith of our entire community if I we change you. those articles of agreement right now. We are not bound to make decisions or to be pushed to do something because one member or the entire, we are bound by our entire district, right? Any member of another district could come and say, please make a motion to say that you will change the article of agreement or that you would put an article of agreement right now we're bound for the articles of agreement as they are i i don't know if you remember this i i, I, I chaired and begged for all of you guys to come up with an agreement we're not changing those articles of agreement right now and we're not going to be bound by a community member just coming and asking us to do it well then if we're not going to be bound Patrick, by Dan brazier asking us to correct do, the, the, do a petition can you can you stop talking for a minute because it was it was oh. patrick's turn oh i'm sorry Patrick. So yeah. I, I think that there's there's mistrust mm -hmm. in, in the district and i think that there's mistrust that whatever the outcome of our deliberations are uh, there'll be continued efforts for a, an outcome that um that is is predestined and i think that's an unfortunate mistrust and i think that that we need to do something to get that trust back. I'm not, I, don't, I don't know if this is the solution, but we need to do something mm -hmm. to get that trust back from our community. And so I, I, think, I think we should try, we should do something to uh, assure um, uh, our, our, our individual towns and our community that, that we, are going to, we are going to stick by whatever decision um, that, that we make and then, and then whatever decision that, that if, if what, what is decided is we recommend that a school is closed and that town decides they're not going to close that school and then, then we honor that decision and we move forward. I think we need to do something to do that. Okay. All right. So we, then we can talk about how we, you know, engage with the community. But we're not bound to do anything tonight. We, we don't have it as part of the agenda and we're not bound to do anything tonight. We had the discussion. We, if you guys want to stay any longer, you're welcome to stay any longer or we can adjourn. Well, and, uh, that's true, we have more, more public comment. Yeah, and we have another person on. on so let's, on let's address that in the next meeting when we put, put it on the agenda as an action item. To do we what? Discuss with this, we will discuss with the steering committee. Just a, a non binding, well, a resolution of the board that there is no intention to uh, propose um, or entertain a petition that would amend the school closure article in our articles of agreement. Can, I, 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 this is where I claim like no knowledge of, of kind of the legalities of that, but I think it might be wise for us to talk to our consul. Uh, council around this just in terms of are we binding ourselves to something that we can't enforce or like because the voters still have rights within this too. I just don't know. Like I, I, I this is me saying I'm not sure but it might be wise just to ask somebody outside of this as to what are we binding ourselves to and what would we be looking at. Because um, I, I just and, and that's just not having knowledge of it. I was phrasing it as a resolution which is not a binding um, action. It's a expression of the voice. Okay. That's so just my we have public comment. Becca? And, and I would say if somebody in the public online wants to comment, please just raise your hand. Hi, everyone. It's Becca. Um, so I haven't seen you guys in a while. I'm sorry. It's nice to be back. Um, <laughs> so I have a question. Um, this is sort of for you, Jen, but are there any benefits curriculum-wise to keeping the existing configuration? Um, I felt like your slide was all sort of negatives, and I really appreciated getting to see the what the special education, some pros and some cons. And so I would be surprised if there were no pros, so I would love to be able to find that out later at a, another meeting or, or something like that. Um, you know, don't, don't answer now. <laughs> um, 
Uh, and then I have lots of other curriculum questions, which I'll hold for another day. But um, I think the other qu question follows up on something that you were saying earlier is, yeah, we've been told that the consolidation will bring a lot of expanded opportunities. And so it would be really great to see a list of those and how those shake out and just have a sense that if we do end up closing some of our schools, how do we know that we're actually going to get those benefits? And how, what's the procedure? What's the... Um, the follow through on that because we've seen you know a lot of talk about closing you know the benefits that we would get from consolidation of the district which have not panned out so um and then this is a question about some of the the hiring that just happened the new librarian at rumney are they provisionally licensed and how long does that take to get the actual license it looked from their um bio that they don't have a library science background and, and stuff like that. So library is just so important with, with tech and stuff, and it, we only get 45 minutes of it. I just really want to make sure that all our kids are getting access to you know, someone who really knows the technology. And I don't know enough about this person, but it, it was hard, very hard to tell from their bio. So just curious about that. Thank you. And not can I go? I'm Lee Garrity. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please. Go ahead. I just have kind of a, a quick question, which is who's going to pay for the middle school certification for the sixth grade teachers that will need to get it? And the seven through, I mean, I guess at U32, most teachers, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, but if they teach middle school in a core setting, are usually certified seven through 12. In order to get certified for middle school, they have to go, I think somebody said that they would go to the middle school institute in the summer. And I'm wondering who's going to pay for that. And also, whether you, how are you going to make that happen for people that may not have the time over the summer to be able to do that? And also bearing in mind that if a sixth grade teacher gets certified for middle school, they're going to have to do a lot more core, most likely they're going to have to do more coursework than the seven through 12 certified people are. I hope I'm saying this right. Um, and when you're hiring for those positions, are the sixth grade teachers the ones that are more liable to lose their jobs at that point or get rift or whatever the appropriate way to say that is because it's going to take them longer to get certified i just have those questions thank, thank you for you. listening not missing anybody else okay. uh, noah go ahead oh, actually no you went before and lisa went before i'm going to let alan go first and then i'll go right to two of you mr gilbert you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I want to say that Chris is correct in interpreting what I meant, so I appreciate that. Um, I do think that it would be a good idea to somehow reaffirm that you that you make a formal commitment to not attempt to override any district's town vote regarding the, the, the uh, closure of its own school. I think there is a problem about trust in the the procedures that have been going on. And I think it's necessary for the board to just say very plainly and uh, uh, in, in a very short sentence that we're, we're, we're just affirming what we understand the intent of the articles of agreement were. And, and that was that the individual towns would have final say on whether a school would be closed the last thing I wanted to do, I, I actually had come up with a whole long thing that from academic journals about how there's no evidence that savings come from close, closing schools or that even increased academic opportunities come from closing schools. I don't know if any of you have seen the article that's in this week's uh, New Yorker, but it's about how schools are being closed around the country. And there was one sentence in here, a couple of sentences that really struck me uh, when I was reading it. And it is, it, it, it is, there is a pathos to a closed school that doesn't apply 
to a shuttered courthouse or post office. The abandonment of a building once full of young voices is an indelible sign of the action having moved somewhere else. There is a tangible cost too. Researchers have found that students whose schools have been closed often experience declines in attendance and achievement, and that they tend to be less likely to graduate from college or find employment. When I first read that, I thought that was just, that, that sounds really crazy to me. How can anybody even begin to think that something that happens when you're a seven-year-old is going to continue for many more years in your life, even as you move on? And apparently, it, it really is true that people, people get a connection to something in their lives through a school that is different than almost any other connection they make. And when that's broken, it's a very serious uh, thing for a child to have to go through. And I never had to go through that. And so I can't say if it's right or wrong. But I believe that more and more people are inflicting that upon children. And I think we shouldn't do it upon our own. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I am glad that Alan got to go before me. Um, he and I worked on the language together about the, the last paragraph of his letter. And I, I hear what you're saying, Floor, with regards to why affirm something that you're already bound to. And if that is the case and that doesn't make sense, then you know I, I would say that absolutely the way that um, Chris and Patrick have portrayed this is very, very true, at least in my experience, that there's a great deal of mistrust right now that if the board puts the school closure question to the town of Worcester and Worcester votes to keep it open, which we've all said many times is very, very likely to happen, that the board would then just say, okay, you know, that that's, that's what's happening now. Um, if the board just makes a formal commitment, not even a legally binding commitment, but just makes a formal commitment to not attempt to override any district town's vote regarding the closure of its own school, that would that that's all that's all that I'd be asking for. Not a legally binding thing, not something that would be bound for the future. But again, I think it would go a long way in terms of the preservation of trust in the district and the community for the board simply to say, yeah, we're gonna honor what you guys vote because that's what we agreed to do. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Lisa. Um, just two quick things that came up for me today. Um, Stephen said earlier that the reasoning behind talking simultaneously about moving sixth grade and reconfiguring was largely because the structural impacts on Romney and EMES, if we were to reconfigure without moving sixth grade. I would just ask you that you don't ignore the converse. If the board decides to move sixth grade to U32 and Worcester chooses to keep its school open, um, there will be negative impacts on Doty's viability without sixth grade there and its structure. So we need to think about all schools equitably as we think about these two things at the same time. Um, and the second point um, that I just wanted to make, and this is connected to trust as well, as someone who's been following this for months, it has seemed like throughout this conversation, the board and admin has leaned heavily and emphasized EQS as a key data point, right? And really focused on those class size recommendations as one of those EQS key data points. Um, tonight, when one of the reconfiguration numbers exceeded EQS, it felt like the tone really shifted. Um, and for me personally, and only speaking for myself here, but that, um, that really uh, just concerns me in terms of my trust in this process and how we use data and when we um, emphasize it for one purpose or when we de-emphasize it um, to, to suit what feels like our objectives. So um, just another, that, that really struck me tonight, how our tone on EQS class size recommendations seem to shift. Thanks. I just wanted to speak a little bit about trust in this process. I think um, it would be really beneficial for our the community of Worcester to hear that should our town vote to keep our school open, uh, it does not progress into future years, that it doesn't become, okay, well, let's do four schools this year, and then three years down the line, let's go down to three schools again. Um, certainly just as an adult who's been heavily involved in this process, it's emotionally exhausting and I'm sure it is for the board as well. This is hard work that you're doing. Um, but it's also really hard on our, our students. Uh, I try very hard to not let my second grader really know the full breadth of what we're working on here and what's being discussed. Um, 
But like many in his school, he's well aware that his school could disappear next year. And he has been begging me to speak to the board um, to basically cry out and say, please, you know, don't close my school. I love it. I never want to leave it. Um, and I think that's really harmful if it continues. So if the community does vote to keep our school, I hope for everyone's sake, adult and child alike, that we can move on and we can find other ways to improve educational outcomes, opportunities for all of our students across the district uh, and not revisit the same undesired or voted against uh, ideas. Thank you. That was the last item on our agenda. So I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Oh, wait, sorry. Wait, Daniel had his hand up first. Hand up. Uh, I just had a reflection, yeah. or two reflections. One was appreciation for the three administrators who were on their feet and answering a lot of questions tonight. <laughs> um, much gratitude to you all for, um, for sticking with us through that. And I think the other thing that I want to just bring up is it's it feels semantic, but it's the word configuration or reconfiguration. And maybe it's it's important to me because I've been I've been called out publicly for using a misleading euphemism, but for me it's not a, a misleading euphemism. For me, it's it's at the crux of this, and it's not it's not about what we're closing. I I want to respect that we are talking about really serious things when we talk about school closures as one implication of reconfiguration. But for me, moving from five to three elementary schools is one aspect of configuration. Opening three new communities, school communities, is another aspect of configuration. Moving sixth grade to 32 is a third aspect of configuration. And I, just, I wanted to just bring that up and make sure we're careful with our Thank you, Daniel. That's very well said. Any other reflections? Um, first reflection, I, I, I'm reflecting that I feel like this is actually one of the better tones of conversations we've had around this. Um, and I appreciate that we're able to have the kind of conversations and dialogue that we're having. Um, and for me personally, this is one of the first meetings where I actually feel like I'm being listened to <laughs> when I'm talking as opposed to just being like, oh God, there she goes again. Um, so so I appreciate it. Like I felt like there was a Good. different feeling and tone in the room um, tonight in, in both meetings. So I wanted to put that out there. The other thing I just wanted to say um, is I, in terms of trust of the community, I. I do hope that if it is voted that the school stays open, that the board and the district stay committed to providing support and resources to whatever school is decided to, is voted to uh, stay open, and it doesn't become this because you voted no on closing, you've created all these problems. So I really, I just want to put out there that I hope that as a board and as a district, regardless of what the outcome is, that we are going to make a commitment to our community to continue to support and provide resources to whatever the, con the configuration looks like after this decision is made. So I'm going to reaffirm as a superintendent <laughs> that my responsibility is to make sure that I fulfill the wishes of this board and this community in making sure that every one of our kids is educated to the best that we can do. And, and we will struggle with any decision that we make and how we do that, but I, I promise you that every kid is the most important kid in our district. And so we're going to keep working at them. And I, I appreciate, like really do appreciate the board bearing with me as I get my feet under myself and that we're able to um, have these conversations because these are the worst and hardest conversations that, that we have to have, but they're also necessary for us to figure out. I think I've learned a lot about our district in just a very short amount of time that I think is really important for all of us to, 
to uh, to just recognize that this is the work that we do, and and uh, and so it's been really nice, although rushed at times. But I really appreciate it, and and I hope that we can make sure that all of our voices are heard. And thank you. Anything else? Welcome, Julia. Yeah. Your first yeah. meeting. Welcome. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a lot of work, but we will get through it, and we'll see the other side. Three people are doing it. Did we move? Yeah. Okay. A, a motion to adjourn. Chris, you had motion. And, I did. Yeah. And a second. Whoever wants it. Okay, we'll second. Julius for a second. Hi. Goodbye. Give it time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you for attending. Good night, everybody.